Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. It's our Monday, January 10th, 2022 meeting. If you'd all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And at this point in time, I'd like to introduce the members of the uh, commission that are here. To my uh, far right is Jamie Hine, who's an alternate on the commission. Next to uh, Jamie is uh, Jeff Cohan, a commission member. To my immediate right is James Fitzsimmons, also a commission member. To my immediate left is uh, Steve Allenson, a commission member. And to Steve's left is David Parent, who's an alternate on the commission. At the uh, Lower table is Cheryl Ann Tubby, who is our recording secretary. And sitting right in front of us all is Kevin Pagini, who is our town planner. And I'm Jim Seichter. I'm the uh, chairperson of the commission. I'd like to start off with uh, consideration of our minutes of uh, December 13th, 20, 2021. Any commission members with any corrections, additions to the minutes? If none, I'd entertain a motion on the minutes. Chairman, I move we approve the minutes as submitted. We have a, a motion to approve the minutes. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Cohan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. Good. Moving on, our first order of business is a uh, continuation of a public hearing. It's a zoning text amendment for the Planning and Zoning Commission for data centers by special permit in the IX and the I-5 zones. Mr. Allison, if you would please uh, note all additional correspondence for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can. Okay. We have a revised uh, set of amendments. Is that on? There we go. S sorry about that. Um, we have a revised set of um, uh, set of amendments, uh, redlined, date of revision, January 5th, 2022. Correspondence from... Andrew Mays and Eugenia Mays, dated September 8th, 2021. Correspondence to the City Clerk of Meriden. Mailed 9921. We have correspondence uh, from our town planner to Eugene Lifshitz, mailed 98 2021. Interdepartmental referral from our fire marshal, dated 916 21. Interdepartmental referral from our town engineer, dated 929 21. A, uh, another set of zoning text amendments, uh, revised date October 12th, 2021. A document uh, cover sheet entitled Chicago, Illinois Data Center. It's a uh, multi page document and it starts with Why Chicago? Question mark. A document from Richard Leroux uh, from the Wallingford Land Trust, dated November 3rd, 2021. Correspondence from Gregory Tochi, dated January 5th, 2022. Uh, email correspondence from Stephanie Massimino. To uh, the commission dated January 6, 2022. Correspondence to the commission from Adelaide Kupfer dated 1 9, 2022. And I believe that concludes the documents. Oh, Mr. Marshall, just a clean copy, please. You notice the red line. Oh, I'm sorry. There's also a clean copy, non red lined of the zoning text amendment, the proposed zoning text amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allison. Just before uh, we get started, uh, 
like to just make an announcement. We're not going to be taking any action on this application this evening. The reason for that is our uh, acoustical engineer, sound engineer, uh, Gregory Tucci, informed us uh, late this afternoon that because of uh, COVID protocols, he is not able to attend the meeting. Uh, we had, uh, you know, initially discussed perhaps having him uh, join remotely. However, that really is not an option. And also speaking with him, he felt it would be much more beneficial that he be in person to answer questions from commission members as well as from the public. Uh, so at the, uh, Mr. P uh, Pagini is going to give a presentation. We'll have the uh, commission have the opportunity to ask some questions as well as the public. After that, uh, what we, at least what I'm planning on doing uh, with the approval of the commission is scheduling a uh, special meeting the early part of February to uh, continue this application. Uh, our normal meeting for February is the 14th. Uh, however, Mr. Tochi indicated that he is not available on that date. So we will work with him as well as the commission and our corporation council to arrange uh, for a special meeting uh, on the application. But I thought it important as, uh, instead of postponing this meeting, as I knew there'd be a lot of people from the public that were you know, out here that may have questions, and some people that are here this evening may not be available to uh, come to an, uh, another meeting. So we'll have a presentation again from uh, Mr. Pagini, and uh, we'll entertain questions and then go from there. So with that, uh, Mr. Pagini, you have the wheel. Uh, so over the last couple of months, uh, we've listened to the public as well as comments raised by the commission up to this point. Uh, we've consulted with other municipalities, contacted sound experts, and have done our own research into this use. Uh, we tried our best to understand every concern that has been raised and believe this regulation will allow for a responsible development of data centers in the least invasive way possible and with the least amount of impact uh, to surrounding neighborhoods in the IX and I-5. You gentlemen can turn the lights down a little bit. Thank you. Also, if I could, just before uh, Mr. Pagini gets started, there, uh, again, he does have a presentation. There are some copies of the presentation that are on this table for, you know, after his presentation, if people would like to uh, pick those up, certainly feel free to do that. With that, uh, Kevin. And I just want to make a note that most of this was uh, based on the sound engineer attending the meeting, so there is a lot of uh, stuff regarding sound that uh, we can defer to the next meeting. So the summary of changes that have been made since October, uh, we added a minimum setback of 500 feet uh, from the data center buildings to residential properties, uh, added a minimum setback of 750 feet to electrical substations to residential properties. Uh, further setbacks can be required as part of the special permit application process. Uh, we added a definition for background noise level as well as changes to sound mitigation strategies for HVAC and emergency generators. And as uh, we mentioned, we consulted with Gregory Tochi of Kavanaugh Tochi Associates. Um, and he's a board certified noise control engineer and has experience working uh, with data centers. And we also added regulations for generators, including allowable time for testing and documentation requirements. And the, these were primarily questions uh, for the noise consultant. Uh, could, just go through them quickly, but I won't be able to answer them as well as he would have been able to. Uh, basically, he told us more power usage translates to more noise. Uh, the major contributors to noise are the HVAC systems and the emergency generators. Um, wet cooling is less noisy than dry cooling. Uh, data centers in our climate would be using dry cooling systems. Most facilities are using dry cooling systems. Low speed fans, barriers, and other acoustical noise controls can be used to reduce the noise of HVAC units. Uh, example, air intake and discharge silencers on ventilation units. 
um, and required that any testing of emergency generators that performed during loudest ambient noise levels, typically during the day. Uh, the permitting process, so allowing data centers as a special permit use does not mean any data center will automatically be approved. Uh, special permits are used to apply additional conditions to uses within a zone and take into account the location of the use. Uh, special permits also allow the commission to determine that the use is not appropriate for a certain property uh, if they deem uh, to find that. Uh, we have listened to and understand every concern that has been raised and we feel that this regulation uh, will impact the neighborhood in the least invasive way possible and with the least amount of impact to the surrounding neighborhood. And again, any application would likely also be subject to inland wetlands approval. And any application wishing to utilize the tax incentives available will also be subject to a municipal host agreement approved by the town council. Uh, monitoring, this was brought up during the course of the public hearing um, and it was discussed at length whether to you know, allow ongoing monitoring or not. Uh, and we came to the conclusion just uh, that monitoring requirements can be addressed through the conditions of approval when an application is presented to the commission and monitoring can be required post-construction to ensure compliance with approved sound levels before a certificate of occupancy is issued and further compliance testing can also be required when any changes are made to the building as a condition of approval. Uh, any further monitoring beyond this would be complaint-based and dealt with as other zoning land uses are handled. Uh, we currently do not have a use that we uh, monitor for sound on a regular basis. Uh, emissions, based on the review of the EPA Clean Air Act requirements, regulations only allow for 50 hours a year for use of emergency generators for demand response purposes, which includes peak shaving. Peak shaving might also increase required generator sound controls. Um, all generators must also comply with Connecticut DEEP permitting and emissions requirements for emergency generators. Uh, the use and duration of non-emergency use of generators can also be made a condition of approval through the special permit process. And applicants must provide documentation of when generators are going to run, how they will be used, and for what purpose they will be used for. Uh, we conducted uh, just uh, a search through scholarly journal databases and that resulted in no direct links to data centers and human illnesses. Traffic, uh, it's anticipated that a data center would generate at a maximum 30 to 35 vehicle trips during the peak hour of the surrounding roadway network. Uh, parking areas are also very minimal, sometimes only requiring one space per 3,500 square feet. So a 100,000 foot data center might only require 29 parking spaces. And any application that exceeded the 100 peak hour vehicle trips will be subject to special permit requirements as they already exist in the zoning regulations, including the submission of a traffic study and funding for a peer review consultant hired by the commission. And this is just an example data center from Ashburn, Virginia. Um, it's approximately a 350,000 square foot building and has roughly 115 parking spaces, most of, most of which seem underutilized. Uh, I actually contacted Loudoun County, Virginia, and uh, it sort of explained that they the earlier data centers that they approved had more parking and as they realized they didn't need the parking, they uh, allowed less and less. Uh, for comparison, the Wallingford train station parking lot on North Cherry Street has 70 spaces. Um, the proposed minimum required parking for data centers in our new regulation is one space per employee at peak shift. And according to a 2014 report by CBRE Group, uh, the number of employees in an average data center is approximately 30. Um, this was brought up during the course of the public hearing, uh, whether or not data centers uh, have been built adjacent to residential areas. We did find a number of examples across the country where data centers are located sometimes as close as 80 feet to residential neighborhoods. Uh, from our research, we do recommend a 500 foot setback to residential properties, which will likely need to be paired with other noise mitigation strategies to achieve compliance. Um, our current zoning regulations require a minimum 500 foot setback from residential properties to some industrial uses in the I-40 and I-20, uh, primarily uses that tend to be more noisy. Uh, most uses currently allowed in the IX and I-5 zones do not require a setback of this size. Uh, this is an example from Virginia where it's approximately 160 feet from the building to the residential property line. And this is roughly a 300,000 square foot uh, data center. 
uh, electrical substations adjacent to residential areas. We also found examples across the country where electrical substations were located sometimes as close as 230 feet to residential neighborhoods. Uh, from our research, we recommend a 750 foot setback uh, to allow the actual buildings to screen most of the noise uh, from the substations. Uh, this could be paired with other noise mitigation strategies to achieve compliance. And the sound produced by the substations would also be required to be included in the facility-wise noise study. And that's just an example from Arizona where uh, the neighborhood had some complaints regarding the noise from the substation and it's roughly 230 feet uh, to the residential property line. And uh, we, like I said, we looked into noise complaints from around the country, uh, including Chicago, Illinois, Chandler, Arizona, Loudoun, Virginia. Um, and the, these neighborhoods were not properly protected during the approval of data centers. Many of these communities do not have adequate requirements for data centers and list them as an allowed use, not a special permit as is proposed here. Uh, we could not find any other community proposing the level of regulation and requirements being presented today. Uh, submission of a sound and vibration impact analysis also appears to be a unique requirement specifically for data centers, as is the peer review. Uh, and our noise consultant has reviewed the proposed regulation and has stated uh, that they are protecting of neighboring residential properties. Um, some comments have mentioned wanting an acoustical engineer hired by the commission uh, to perform an independent sound and vibration impact analysis uh, beforehand. Uh, we agree that a second set of eyes in the analysis will be beneficial, uh, but we don't require an independent analysis for traffic studies and are not concerned that fraudulent reports will be submitted by a credentialed professional engineer. Uh, the analysis and peer review will both be certified by a professional acoustical engineer. And that was the last slide. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Pagini. You know, as I mentioned, uh, again, the uh, sound engineer is not here this evening to address questions that the commission has or the, uh, the public has, but certainly if people do have questions, uh, they would be passed on and hopefully addressed at the, uh, at the next meeting. But before I go to the public, are there commission members that have uh, specific questions for Mr. Pagini on the, uh, on the regulation? Mr. Fitzsimmons, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Brignini, for your um, presentation. I, I received the copy when I came in tonight, but I had done some looking at the regs. So my, question, my first round of questions are regarding the proposed text amendment. Mm -hmm. On slide number two, it says, consulted with Gregory Kochi? Yes. Um, and I, I made a note here, and I'm not shy to ask this question. Does he represent both municipalities and applicants, or is he one way only represents municipalities? Um, Much like a law firm sometimes does plaintiff work and sometimes does defense work, do you know if he does both? I believe he does both, but I don't uh, have a firm answer on that. Okay. And then on slide number six, under the emissions, it yes. says, applicants must provide documentation of when generators are going to be run, how they'll be used, and for what purpose they'll be used for. That statement, I, I guess, is a question. Would it, is our expectation to be consistent for each applicant? You know, if yes. ABC company and XYZ company are both data centers, they should all have a standard? Not, not so much a standard, but we just want to know, you know, what they're going to be using the generators for and for what purpose and how. So it's, it's essentially just getting as much information as we can from the applicant regarding the generator usage. Okay. The slide above that was monitoring. And, and I'm on record with everybody I'm sitting with and, and the person in the front row who works for the town and, and, and the, the person in the second row who works in your office regarding monitoring and conformance compliance. So my experience up here has been mostly related to traffic. You know, when we have a special permit, it's all about the traffic. Right. And then we, we can rely on 
the police department, because the chief of police in Wallingford is our legal traffic authority. Yep. Who would be the backup for a noise issue that comes up of an approved applicant? Um, that's a good question. The, well, the police enforce the noise ordinance now, um, so I believe through, uh, through that, that's, that's who is the enforcement for noise in the town. So is a zoning, a zoning violation of noise would be referred to not the law department, but the police department? Uh, yes. Okay. And, and, and I, I guess because of the, the comments you talked about, because or the, the, from the presentation, it says, any further monitoring beyond this would be compliant-based and dealt with as other zoning land uses are handled. Oh, complaint-based. Complaint-based, excuse yeah. me. So would that also be the zoning enforcement officer? Uh, yes, I believe she would take the initial, uh, you know, uh, complaint and then, you know, follow up with the uh, company and see if they would rectify the situation and if the police had to deal with it as a noise ordinance uh, problem, they, they would, I guess. I think they have the monitoring equipment, whereas we don't. I, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not shy and, and I would share with you, this, the monitoring piece concerns me the most. Mm -hmm. I know other people are concerned about other pieces of this, right. but if it were to be added to the regs and we were to go through all this exercise and if indeed some, it's the monitoring, you know, the assurance for mm -hmm. the protecting the town, protecting <coughs> neighbors, protecting others. And, and I, I don't know what you could do between now and the next meeting to get more information related to monitoring. I mean, and I, the reason I asked about consultant, okay, is, is because mm -hmm. we've had the experience, Mr. Seichter and I and, and others up here, where we want to hire someone for a, a peer review right. of, well, you know, they can't, you know, so now we're left with kind of going further down the, the baseline as to who mm -hmm. else we could use. So um, I, I guess that that's why I asked if our, the person you've consulted it, um, represents both sides. Okay. So, um, and then on the, the slide you have regarding the Ashburn, Virginia location, you, you cite a 2014 report by CRBE Group. Is there something more current, or that's the only study you have related to the number of employees at an average data center? Because I would that's, imagine there's been significant change since 2014. Uh, that's all we can find, but uh, also other municipalities I spoke with said it's generally in, in roughly the like 30 to 25 range. Is this, a, is this a use listed in the ICT traffic study book? In the ICT traffic study book? No. It's not. Last question this round um, has to do with your last your last slide peer review versus independent sound analysis and I, I guess as you could my first questions on the monitoring related to mm -hmm. we're going to be left trying to find someone to do a review of someone else's information and you know I, I never think of but a, the review we use for traffic which is a comparison they have to give is mm -hmm. they're only looking at their data they're not doing their own data and, and I, if I'm reading your slide correctly, we're not doing, we're not recommending our own independent analysis. We're just recommending a, re, a professional review of the analysis that the applicant submits. Correct. And okay. Allison felt that uh, from an engineering standpoint that she doesn't believe a professional engineer would put his credentials on the line to submit a report that doesn't have correct data. Okay. Are you aware, has the Wallingford, unfortunately, I, I think of various uses in town that have triggered noise complaints, large mm -hmm. uses. Has the police department ever had to, to hire someone for this or has it strictly been zoning? I know you're newer to Wallingford, but have you discussed this at all with the chief? Uh, I have not. Uh, the only one that's been brought up is Thurston Foods. Um, I don't know where that stands at this point.
Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Other commission members? Mr. Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Pagini, um, when you consulted Mr. Pochi, did he have any uh, suggestions regarding the, the mon monitoring um, or, or the, um, the suggestions that you have in that monitoring slide? Uh, he, he kind of alluded to, you know, the fact that monitoring would be very tough for us if we don't have the necessary equipment. Um, he doesn't, he's never seen a place recommend monitoring after the fact. Okay, uh, so that is something that he opined uh, on. Yes. Okay. Um, did, um, but we do have the equipment. Then correct. Uh, the, our police department, you believe, has the equipment to do at least the testing. I, I believe they might have something, but nothing to the effect of what an engineering firm would have for monitoring equipment. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, Mr. I, can I just maybe just interrupt you just for a second? Again, you're asking some questions on monitoring. Mr. Fitzsimmons has asked some questions on monitoring. Obviously, Mr. Pagini is. You know, not been here for an extended period of time with the town. I notice our corporate counsel is here, uh, Attorney Small, and I think perhaps she may be uh, the appropriate person to speak and address some of those uh, some of those questions. So the police department did have the monitoring equipment, um, which has to be continuously calibrated or whatever is. Re I think the last time I had a conversation with them about it. Um, no one had been currently trained in that equipment. We did, however, I think within the past year, had a complaint from a resident regarding a neighboring industrial use being suddenly um, very noisy, and the police did investigate it. Um, it turns out the industrial use user was doing something unusual um, they were waiting for something to be repaired, and they conceded that they were quite loud. Um, but they resolved the issue just through dealing conversations with the police and getting the, the repair made as soon as possible. So it was resolved. So, um, you know, in a circumstance particularly of, of this nature, I would suspect we would hire a professional to do it. Otherwise, they would have to talk to the chief about having somebody re trained again and then keeping the, the equipment calibrated. Um, you know, something of this nature, I think you would want somebody professional to be doing it. Excuse me, an attorney small, then the steps, what would the steps be? We go out and we monitor and we find that they're in violation of that. How would that progress? Well, we would give the, the notice that we would give anyone else who's um, been in violation and if, it's, if they don't look to correct it, then we'd have to make a decision whether we're going to bring in an injunction action against them. Thank you. Again, I apologize for interrupting you, Mr. Hine. Uh, that was helpful, thank you. Um, and so I, I just wanna, uh, um, following up on, on that, uh, we can require, you're suggesting that as part um, of these regulations, given that it's a special permit, we could require mm -hmm. um, monitoring as a condition of approval? Correct. Okay. What if we did not require that on a, a data center project? What, what, and, and you then had the data center uh, built and you had a um, increase in noise um, that violated these regulations, what would you do then? It would be the same thing that she just described. Uh, you send a notice of violation, uh, you'd go out and uh, investigate the complaint, and then obviously step up enforcement action if necessary. Okay, so uh, the reason why I'm asking the question, and just so that I'm clear, mm -hmm. um, in each of those cases, it would be the town that would be um, paying to have that um, monitoring done? 
Yes. Uh, unless we require the Correct. applicant to pay for the monitoring as a condition of approval. Yes. Um, is that, uh, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Fitzsimmons that that is a, an important um, uh, consideration here. Um, the, if I could just move, uh, um, Mr. Chairman, if, if we're, uh, if this is okay, if I could move to the actual regulation. Um, oh, no, absolutely. Okay. Um, I don't have it in front of me currently. Hold on. <laughs> you all set? Yep. Okay. Um, I, I was looking at um, paragraph 5A, which is on the first page, uh, section 2.2, or I'm sorry, a proposed new section 4.9.C.5A. You see that there? It begins with submission of a sound and vibration impact analysis. Yes. About halfway down there, it there's a reference to um, submitting this analysis um, to ensure that the noise to be admitted from the proposed development does not raise the existing background sound level. Uh, and then if I can skip down, by more than five dBA. Um, you see that there? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't see anywhere in the proposed proposed regulation where there's ex an explicit prohibition against an increase of that level. I would defer this to the next meeting for the yeah, sound engineer. Yeah, well, the, I, it, I cannot speak on that. Yeah, I, 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 this is more of a, um, I, I'm not commenting on the level itself, mm -hmm. okay? But this, that particular section is only dealing with the, um, the analysis, the impact analysis that has to be submitted, right? No, it's the actual, it's the actual, the actual proposal cannot be increased by that level. Mm. So it's the noise That's to be emitted. That's not how I read that. The noise to be the emitted from the proposed development does not raise the existing background sound level. Uh, That's I, what the, I, I, I sort of read that as we're requesting that a submission, that the applicant submit a sound and vibration impact analysis containing detailed information concerning all of this. It is um, to, it's, it's the point of the study is to ensure that the noise from the proposed development does not raise the existing background sound level. Right. and and. I think that's true, and I think the purpose behind that is because we want to make sure that the sound is not increasing. Correct. To that level. Well, why not just say that? Why not have a separate paragraph that says you that you cannot, any project, any data center, cannot raise the sound level above you know, uh, that level? We just thought it was um, necessary to put it in. Uh, the actual study, but I mean, yeah, you, can, you I, can put it I, separately as well. I mean, I just think well. it could be clearer, and I think it'd be, you know, it gets it gets somebody's attention um, taken. a little bit better. Um, also, further down that um, paragraph, um, or uh, there's a reference that it cannot create vibration levels to a degree perceptible to the neighboring property. That was a direct uh, quote from the sound engineer. Okay. I just want to know what, what, I think we should be clear as to what neighboring properties mean. Do we mean abutting, directly abutting properties? Do we, need, do we mean just properties in the area? Um, I think that we have to be a little more uh, detailed or direct on that because neighboring properties kind of open. You're looking for like an exact distance or 
I mean, you can go, you can, you can be very specific or you can be a little more vague at that point, so. Yeah, uh, well, I, I just think you're gonna, uh, that leaves it open to interpretation and um, that could cause everybody, um, including your office problems if, um, because your, your office is gonna be determining what neighboring properties means. But I think, um, <laughs> but also that's the point of the sound study is to you know understand, you know what uh, what properties. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit here by <laughs> by well, going that far. But I think these. Well, if we're going to go back and and take a look at the language and make sure. I, I, I mean, I think these are things that I at least I foresee as being a potential issue going forward. I think if, if when he was discussing that with us, you know, those, that was his exact language uh, was to phrase it that way. So yeah. um, if you find that there's something, there's a better way to phrase it, we could discuss that with him and, and get back to you. Yeah, I guess, Mr. Hyde, would you like to offer some, I guess, some comments as far as what uh, you would uh, be comfortable or would, would like to see here or some, at least some suggestions to be discussed? Well, I, I think even if you just use the phrase directly abutting, um, but then it kind of, uh, you know, if someone maybe a little further away complains of the noise, then that kind of doesn't protect them. So, we well, as though well, then, or, or then we use a, a particular um, uh, distance uh, from the property. But we uh, and what that distance may be is, you know, we would have to consult maybe the ta the sound engineer on that. Yeah. Um, but I think just you, just using neighboring properties. That can mean anything. Um, but it kind of, uh, I think it kind of leaves it more open for, you know, whoever wants to complain can complain. And then there isn't a set distance that you're not in a quarter mile of the property, then you don't have an argument or, or something, so. Yeah, but uh, 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 I, I get, I, we don't need to, to belabor the point. Um, it's, it's that, uh, again, I read that, that paragraph to deal with the submission of a sound and vibration impact analysis. And so when somebody submits that analysis to your office and to us, mm -hmm. that leaves it open as to how far out they have to go with, because it's gonna be dependent upon what they consider to be neighboring properties. Well, I think um, when we, I don't know, say for example, the Amazon uh, application they they submitted a noise study and it showed you know the uh, the noise levels in a certain area and so I think you know having mapping technology something that can show you where it, where it may affect the, the properties it kind of leaves it open for that so it's not so much as a set in stone distance but um, we want them to tell us how far uh, vibrations may impact from the development um, the, the other um, question I had is um, if we go to the second page, 4.9.C.5. it's um, E, sub E. Mm -hmm. um, where it says where any side front or rear yard abuts a residential property or property located within a residential zoning district. And then it sets out the minimum side uh, or the minimum setback. What if you had a, I mean, is it possible in this district to have a um, potentially a, another commercial property between the uh, data center property and a residence, but still be within that five, uh, 500 feet? Oh, you're talking, no, that, that only applies if, it, if the property that the data center is on directly abuts 
So it wouldn't apply if, say, you know, there's a commercial use in between or something, uh, because, uh, I mean, that would be a, a uh, per application basis, I'm guessing. I don't want to be too restrictive, so we're requiring 500 foot setbacks from commercial or industrial uses. So um, we felt that that was the best way to word that uh, without being overly restrictive. And yeah, I just want to make sure that we have, we're guaranteeing a 500 foot setback from residential or property. From a resident, no matter you know, no matter what. Um, so it has to be you know abutting, so you can't be in the vicinity necessarily. So um, yeah, it would be I, hard to word that. I think another way. Yeah, uh, I, I I just I just wonder if there's a better way to do that because uh, obviously we're we're asking for the 500 feet to provide some protection. Yes. And um, it seems to at least possibly create an exception where you have a, a property in between and then if there's a property in between you don't get that that 500 foot protection no I understand what you're saying <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's hard to anticipate every single situation when you're writing yeah. you know, zoning yeah. regulations so that's um, I think that that's really at least for, for tonight I, I have other questions mm -hmm. but I can hold off until the town engineers here Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hine. Other commission members? Mr. Cohan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't want to repeat what the, the two previous commissioners have said, but uh, um, I, I do have a couple of questions. You know, monitoring is important, and, you know, what I don't really see as far as monitoring is you know, something specific in our regulations that, you know, deal with that at this point. <clears throat> you know, it looks like it's a suggestion, you know, an important uh, task that needs to be done. But, um, y you know, I would like to <clears throat> be proactive in the monitoring and not have to get in a situation where, you know, this place is built <clears throat> And then, you know, a cease and desist order is, is done, um, you know, because they exceeded some of the, the noise uh, standards. Um, I, I think it should be not as part of a condition of approval, but something solid in our regulations. Um, and then, you know, there's a couple other things, you know, same with admissions. I, I do have a couple of questions on whose responsibility is it? Because, you know, this is somewhat, in my humble opinion, a little complex as far as developing these regulations. You know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, electrical substations and the noise emitting from that. You know, is that our responsibility or is that the electrical department? Know, do we have no it would be our responsibility I actually consulted with the electrical uh, division and they said uh, you know as far as the sound and the placement and the screening that you know, it would be zoning to really uh, enforce those regulations uh, as far as but they like you know zoning can't handle the, the, the obviously the connection to the electrical um, something like that but they actually yeah, they had did have input on these regulations um, as far as the substations went. So do, do they have suggestions on, on what those standards are? I mean, it's based on yes, they, you know, the size of uh, you know, the substation. And yeah, they, they, uh, they included the, the language for the substations in uh, the subsection two under F. So they, they had put in uh, their suggestions as to the type of trees uh, the fencing and uh, the location as well. And, and that's written in the regulations? Yes. So after F subsection two. Okay, I, I, I'll find it, I, I don't see it. Um, the the other, other thing um, is that 
Um, this is the permitting process. And this is uh, page two, the, the bottom, uh, uh, bottom PowerPoint slide. And basically it says uh, application, blah, 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 subject to a municipal host agreement approved by the town council. Um, so, you know, wh what does that mean to us? I mean, the, the town council approved this municipal host agreement. And to be honest, I attended all the meetings where they, mm -hmm. uh, you know, debated this and, you know, approved it. But I'm not sure what <coughs> they approved and, and how that, you know, relates to our, you know, authority. Well, essentially, any data center, I believe, I could be wrong on this, but any data center that uh, in town that I believe it's a 30 year uh, agreement of $250, $250 million or more uh, over a 30 year period uh, would uh, be required to enter into a municipal host agreement. So there's a certain threshold set by the state. Uh, that's why uh, this whole process with uh, Godspace kicked in. Right. So but if it's a smaller data center, they would not be subject uh, to that. Well, yeah, I yeah I agree with it, um, but you know what what are the specifics? Um, you know that that we're going to have to worry about. Are we going to have to worry about anything when an application comes before us? You know, is this something that you know we should just copy the host agreement into our regulations? Um, I mean. I, I guess, Mr. Pugini, again, I think this may be a little bit unfair to you. I, I know we see, a, a, you know, attorneys small, so uh, attorneys small, if uh, you could please uh, give some insight into this, if you would, please. Uh, the host agreement specifically states that the requirements that are in there do not affect this commission's ability to create regulations that are, in fact, stricter, and, in fact, that this draft is stricter than what is in the host agreement. So it's, while it's mentioned, this regulation is not about a certain property. It's not about God's space. It's about the zones and allowing the use in the zone. So it's written for that purpose. But it is stricter than what the host agreement is. The host agreement gives one very valuable thing, and that is that it gives the town the ability <clears throat> to be looking at the sound data when they're designing the facility. So that's, you know, that's something that you wouldn't have. It would be all on plans for you. And then you obviously you react to it. But this gives us an earlier step in the process to be criticizing or commenting on what they're doing. Your regulations are your regulations. You write them as you see fit. Um, and this draft is stricter than what the host agreement provides for. Yeah, I understand that, but I, I, I'm probably not asking my question correctly because it hasn't been answered yet. Um, there are some land use specifics in that host agreement that apparently are very restrictive. You know, I, like I said, I, I've, I've heard what they are. My, my question is, do we need to build them into our regs so we are aware of them, we meet them, and they don't conflict? Because, you know, I don't know if they can go back and, you know, review or revise this host agreement. That, well, that's all I'm asking. If, there if there if is this, land use. This, in this commission governs the land use. So you, you write the regulation as you see fit. If, if it conflicts with the host agreement to the point where the host agreement would be violated if they comply with your regulations, then that's a problem for the host fee agreement. That's not your problem. That's the, that would be the town's problem. I don't, so, I don't see that happening. I think your regulation, the, the host agreement makes it very clear. It says in writing, the, the zoning commission can enact regulations that are more strict than what's in that agreement. You weren't looking to tell the commission what to do in terms of creating the land use. Right. I get it, but still, you get an application. 
you know, they, we go through, you know, our permitting process. There is another regulation with the host agreement where, you know, I, I just want to avoid, I want to have it in front of us so that when an application does come in front of us, you know, we don't forget it. We don't, we don't what? miss it. So, oh. you know, is that the town planner's responsibility to pick up on that? No, that's or? actually the, that's the applicant. The applicant has two things it needs to comply with. It needs to comply with the host agreement, and it needs to comply with the zoning regs. And it's going to draft a plan. They're, they're spending, if, they're, if we're talking about something subject to the host agreement, you're talking mm. about at a minimum of a $200 million investment. They're not going to do it wrong. They're going to see that they comply with the requirements of the host agreement and your regulations at the time it sits in front of you. And what, how it fits into the host fee agreement is not your problem. It's their problem, and it could possibly be the town's problem, but it is not the Planning and Zoning Commission's problem. Okay, so, yeah, we're getting to the answer of my question. When they come in, are they going to have to sit before the town council to go over their, their application to say they are meeting the host agreement? That's all I'm asking. Yeah, no, they don't go there for, for any type of approval. The, the requirements of the agreement are in the agreement. But in terms of um, the sound analysis, they have to be talking to the town um, to make sure that it's at the minimum it's designed in accordance with that, but they have to comply with this, which is even more stricter than that. So that's what we would be looking for when they're doing the design phase. So if they do their job right, they're spending $200 million, that at the time they come in here, their position should be that they're in compliance with both. Okay, it's not our responsibility. Thank Correct. you. Um, and, I, and I guess my last point, I do have a couple others, but I'm gonna um, just make this last point. I, I'm not sure, oh, when the sound engineer comes in, what I would like is kind of a demonstration. I don't know if he can do it, but you know, he's, he's gonna be telling us about the ambient noise without the insect background, and we can't have any increase of sound by five decibels. I'd actually like to see what, you know, if he could do a demonstration on, you know, what that, mm -hmm. you know, impact actually and then, I, <laughs> to wrap it up, um, you know, the, the sound and vibration impact analysis is, you know, really key. And, you know, it, it really gets into, um, you know, I, I, I guess a professional um, opinion on, uh, you know, what, what the, the sound and vibration is going to be. And I guess it's going to be based on, you know, the size of the building, number of, you know, uh, you know fans and, and, and all those things. Um, and this will be kind of a paper exercise. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I, I think that... Uh, you know, being a paper exercise and then equating it to, you know, a real life situation. I, I, I think, you know, something needs to be, you know, written in the, in the regulations where, you know, again, I don't want to get into a situation where this thing starts to operate, it exceeds the, you know, expected noise levels and we have to, you know, issue these, you know, uh, warnings and, and whatnot. Um, but, you know, I, I'd, I'd kind of like to make it, if we could, just kind of a, you know, hard, hard stop. I, you know, I, I, I just don't want to, you know, have it get operating and, you know, the, the analysis was wrong and we get in a situation where, um, you know, everybody's upset. So I, I don't know, 
if we could do anything to, you know, make that a little more solid in our regulations. But uh, you know, that's just the real concern I have is, you know, making sure that that paper exercise really has all the variables included so we get a pretty good answer on this. And I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll move along and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Other commission members? Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pagini, for your presentation and for your hard work. I know we're in multiple revisions of these, um, and it's, it's not easy. A um, couple of uh, comments that I've heard from the commission, uh, specifically regarding 5A, regarding the uh, term neighboring versus abutting. Um, I tend to agree with your analysis, Mr. Pagini. Mm -hmm. I think that neighboring protects more people than abutting would protect. And I think that the goal of these regulations are to protect the citizens of the town, the residential individuals that could be potentially affected here. So um, I would tend to favor the neighboring term, even though it may be more subject to interpretation. I think it protects more people. Um, regarding comments on uh, 5E, um, and this is something I don't know. In any of the IX or I-5 zones, are there any mixed-use properties? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I don't believe so, because it's not really a district that has a lot of mixed-use uh, Type uses, it's either there's residential in the IX or there's commercial or industrial uh, uses. I, I, I can't think of any that are, that are sticking on the top of my head, mm -hmm. but um, would you be able to just check and see? What I don't want to run into is in E, where it sets a setback on residential properties, all of a sudden if there's a mixed use property, it is partially residential. Right. and a residence could be affected. So if we do find that there's even just one, mm -hmm. if we could add residential and or mixed use properties to that to protect anyone in a residential or quasi residential setting there. Um, and then I'm still thinking about Mr. Hines question regarding the in between properties. I'm just not sure how to write that. <laughs> so to be continued and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allison. Other commission members? This yes, one, Mr. Perry. Yeah. A non-monitoring question. <clears throat> when you said what, how many people would be employed by the company, is that per shift or is that in total? Uh, that's per peak shift, I believe. Okay so, that's, okay, so that's shift. So they may have more employees, you know, throughout the course of a day, uh, but they said at any one time it's generally 25 to 30 uh, maximum. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Pagini, I, I, Pagini rather, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I'm having a senior moment here. <laughs> Probably am. Uh, but I thought it, at one point we were, in, in, we were having a conversation and as far as, I know we were talking about we have this sound study done, vibration, what have you. We have it all reviewed by an outside consultant and they review it. I thought at one point in time, and again, maybe I missed it, but once the facility was built, then they would need to start the, the building running at, at kind of at their peak capacity. And then you would go out and determine if they were meeting that requirement. I thought that that was something we had discussed. Uh, yes, we discussed that on the slide as making that a condition of approval. Um, so that's something again. So that would that could that could be a condition of approval. That again, right. we have we have the the study done. Uh, it's let's say it's certified, what have you, by a sound engineer. Mm -hmm. But to assure that they are operating according to that study, it could be if we had an application. 
it could be made as a condition of approval that they would have to essentially crank this thing up and operate at their their peak uh, peak operating approval would have to run the generators for mm -hmm. a specific period of time to show that they would then be in compliance from what they've indicated from what the individual who did the peer review did so we would know then that uh, they were meeting that requirement and yeah. then if they wanted to put additional uh, uh, computers or additional HVAC anything uh, additional to that uh, to that property or to the building they would then have to come back and then correct would have to do another Another study would have to provide some information to us that in fact the additions that they're doing or proposing would still meet the parameters of the original uh, requirement. Is yes. That, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, we did it through, through research find that they you know, tend to change their uh, equipment out every three years or so. So that's an important piece of that. Um, so again, any change out of equipment Right. They would, we would have, or they would have to show that in fact they're still staying within the parameters that were approved. Correct. Much like any other uh, business, you know, if they change their facility at all from their original conditions of approval with a special permit, then they have to come back to the commission and, uh, you know, show that their changes aren't going to impact sure. those original conditions. Yeah. So it's not something just a matter, I've shown it to you on paper and someone else has said on paper, yes, it meets the requirement. There is in fact could require yes crank this up and let's mm -hmm. make sure that you in fact what you're how you're operating is how you indicated you in fact said you were going to operate correct okay, thank you I believe mr. Fitzsimmons well actually I do have before I go back to mr. Fitzsimmons who has one or two other questions I'm just going back now and, and again I share the comments that other Commission members made concerning the sound and vibration and some of the suggestions I just go back to the uh, The, 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 the landscaping, if, if you look at uh, on page two, where we're talking about, uh, it's F, I guess it would be 5F, where it says, where any side yard, front yard, rear yard, abuts a residential property located in the residential district, you're going to have to have a 100, uh, 100 foot wide natural open space buffer or a landscape buffer you know, if natural vegetation uh, does not, uh, if it uh, does not exist with an earthen berm six feet high, is that an either or? Because again, you can have, I'm not sure when we talk about a landscape buffer, what that, you know, what that would qualify for. You know, an earthen berm, when you're talking about an earthen berm, I know what right. that is, it's going to be six feet high, it's going to be, uh, what I, I guess, a minimum of three feet wide, it's going to be, you know, 100 feet long, and then you're going to have to have evergreens Mm -hmm. you know, planted in front of it, uh, which seems that that would provide some screening. You know, and that, the, the natural buffer that may be out there, I'm not sure what that could be or what would qualify as a natural buffer. It would seem in some cases, mm -hmm. you know, number uh, two, if you would, being the earthen berm may in fact be more of an effective screen than, you know, than th this natural buffer. Yeah, the, the uh, berm. So it, it just, to me, it seems like it should be instead of more of more of an either or I would think at the commission's discretion well we felt that the berm was necessary no matter what and okay then, you know the rest of the landscaping we we would prefer that they want it you know get rid of existing vegetation if it is there uh, to put in their own landscaping so that's that's the, the way we wrote that um, okay maybe I misunderstood it because it seemed like you'd have the the natural open space or you can have the landscape and then also the 100 foot wide natural open space buffer. Okay, again, when I, maybe it's just me, when I read it, 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 it didn't seem that, but if, if you could just take just another look at it, I, I could be reading it wrong, and if I am, I apologize. Sure, I could change the wording to maybe say, you know, uh, must have a berm or something to that effect. Yeah, to me, I, I don't, again, I don't mean to wordsmith, but no, that, may be, <laughs> that may be, that may be, at least it would perhaps satisfy me, but. Uh, anyway, Mr. Fitzsimmons, I believe you had uh, a question or two before we go out to the public. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I would like to wordsmith something. <laughs> and I, um, I I thought about the, the, the other commissioner's comments, and, and I, I was rereading the reg. Um, 
I believe there's a difference because, and I want to make sure I, I just get this on the record because I do think I, I marked up the comment, I, the, the, the um, proposed text amendment. This amendment would add data centers has an allowed use by special permit in the IX and I-5 districts, correct? Yes. Okay, so that's the subject, that's the title. And then we make multiple references to residential property or residential zoning district. So mm -hmm. I have learned from zoning enforcement 101 and, and sitting up here, it's always not the same thing. So if this is the IX reg, this would be a reg for IX I-5. Yes. So you have a residential zone is abutting the IX. But there are also residential properties in the IX as well. That's, yeah, that, that's where I'm going. So, so I'm, trying to, I'm trying to avoid a problem, right? So I'm just trying to understand the way you refer to both residential property or residential zoning district. So because the IX it, abuts both the R18 uh, along Tankwood Road and uh, there are residential properties that are zoned as IX. Okay, thank you. That, that's, yeah. that's the clarification because you, know, mm -hmm. you, you stated it. So Tankwood Road is zoned uh, industrial R8, or R8. Is zoned R? Uh, Tankwood Road is R18. R, that's what, okay, that's whereas, where I'm going. Whereas I believe most of North Farms up to a certain point is IX. Okay. So, with, since we're not talking, you know, this is just a zone, it's a big amendment to the regs. Mm -hmm. So if I lived on Tankwood Road, I'm in a residential district. So it's not the measurement from my front door, it's a measurement from the district, the Correct. zone line. That, yes. Okay, so that's the clarification. If I'm in the IX, mm -hmm. living in a house, it's a residential use, yep. it's the distance from my front door to the substation? Property line. Property line. So if my house is on 10, 10 acres, mm -hmm. It's the property line from the 10 acre line, not where the front door of the house is. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. So it's any property line, yes. I don't know how it's uh, used. I would, I would clarify for you, I don't think that's clear here. Okay. And, and Mrs. Tory would probably tell you that's been an issue on some other zoning enforcement issues where it talks about front door versus property line versus usage. So right. we, okay. again, I don't, I don't mean, as the chairman said, I don't I want a wordsmith. I don't think it's that clear to me mm -hmm. what you just clarified. So okay. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Fitzsimmons. Other commission members, any final comments before we go out to the public? Seeing none, again, uh, members of the public that would like to speak on the application, please raise your hand and then come and I'll, I'll start on this side of, excuse me. I'll, one second, hold on, sir, please. I'll start on this side of the room. And uh, when you do, please come up and uh, with your name uh, and address. Yes, now, sir. Uh, my name is John Conway. I live in Terrace Garden. Um, one question I have for the attorney uh, before. I may have misunderstood what she said, but once these regulations are in place, you can't come back and review them and make them stricter. Is that correct? When you... The, once the, any regulation, once it's approved, that's the regulation. Uh, a, 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 and, and, you know, an applicant, a member of the public, anyone can come back hmm. and uh, look for a uh, change in a regulation. Both so, ways? Yes. More strict or less strict, is that correct? Yeah, anyone can, yes. Okay. Anyone is, it's open for anyone to come in and request a change in a regulation. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, another thing um, is um, this, I don't know, really know how to word it, the, the deal they made with the electric company, I, I assume that they're buying electricity for cheap, cheaper than normal rates. Is that part of this deal? I, I, again, as far as part of the deal, there, at this point in time, there's no deal on the table. Okay. So well, to, I, to say, you know, to, 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 to give an answer on that, again, this is just simply a regulation allowing a use. Okay. Now, once this regulation, if it should be approved, then an application would come, and that would have a, a whole host of uh, uh, items included in it, which would be looked at at that particular point in time. Mm -hmm. Now, um, oh, I got sidetracked here. Um, I'll just go on to my next question. Is is um, Oh, uh, actually, 
actually, what I want to say is, like, if this company does get electricity at a reduced rate, say, for example, are the residents obligated to pick up the slack? So, again, there, this is simply a regulation to allow, or a proposal to allow data centers as far as the use as far as what agreements there may or may not be with, if there is an application that comes forward, what uh, discussions there may or may not be with the electric division or the town, that is a separate, in, uh, that's a separate uh, issue from what we're considering tonight. So again, I, I think we have to look at it this. This is, there's not an application that we're looking at at the present time. This is just simply a regulation to consider data centers, you know, as an approved use under a, a special permit. Okay. And I have, I have one, one last question. Certainly. Okay. Um, I was, uh, the question I have is, um, if you invoke a special permit for the data center that are not defined in the regulations for a special permit, how, how does that work? I'm not quite sure I understand your question, sir. looking to invoke a special permit for okay. this data company, right? Correct? Well, not for a data company, for data centers. Again, let's step right. away oh, from right. company. Yeah, okay. Well, but they're not defined. They're not defined uh, in, the, in the regulations for a special permit. What's not defined? How you can Give somebody a <clears throat> how you can give somebody a special permit, and it's not defined in the regulations for the special permit. Again, I, I maybe I'm right. thick here, but I just don't okay, understand that, the that's, question. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Again, show of hands. We're going to stay on this side. Yes, uh, individual in the back. Uh, Danielle Conway, 78 Tankwood Road. Um, the property that my husband and I live at um, is at the very end of Tankwood Road. We would be abutted on two sides um, by the proposed uh, zone. Pardon my shortness of breath. I've got an infant kicking me in the ribs as I speak. Take your, um, take your time. <laughs> so to that point, we bought our house about a year ago with the idea of a nice quiet neighborhood to grow our family. Um, and in a couple months, we're going to be doing just that. Um, so this is of a very personal um, subject for us. So um, our health and well-being for both us and our, our child um, is at the forefront of our thoughts. Um, knowing that multiple buildings are proposed, um, the construction by the estimates I've seen could take somewhere between eight and ten years. Um, we're concerned not only about the diesel emissions from the backup generators, but during this extended construction phase. Um, my kid will be in middle school by the time the last building is built. Um, we also have to worry about the low frequency noise emissions um, and the effects that those might have. Um, I appreciate that Mr. Pagini has done some research into those possible health effects, but by my own research, I don't think there has been enough research to fully determine the potential health effects of living this close to one of these facilities. And frankly, we don't want to be the guinea pigs for that. We're not really, uh, not really looking for that. Um, in addition, I know myself and the majority of my neighbors are on well water, and we're concerned of the potential impact that that could have with massive construction, industrial buildings so close. Right now we live across from a farm. Our well water is pretty, um, pretty agreeable. Um, on top of that, we're also concerned about displaced wildlife. Um, I have a pack of coyotes that I hear very clearly in the farmland. You can tell when they've caught a rabbit, they're very vocal about it. Um, if these buildings are now taking up that space, are they gonna be in my backyard? Um, where are they gonna go? Is that, am I gonna be safe walking my dog at night? Um, at this point, I don't see any requirement for an environmental impact study. And these are some of the concerns that might be brought up if one were required. 
Um, and as we've kind of gone through this process, as residents, we've heard a lot about, well, this use could be a lot worse, and this use could be a lot worse, and this use could be a lot worse. The way I see it, current zoning regulations has a lot of better uses for this land. We understand it's going to be developed. We like our town. We want the tax revenue. We get that. However, a lot of the current uses go home at 5 o'clock. They go home on weekends. They're not running on Christmas. Data centers are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can't get away. Um, the sound is constant, and that is a major, major concern. We're not anti-development. We're anti 24 seven imposition into our day-to-day -day lives. So, like I said, we've been in, in our house for about a year. We went to all the town council meetings. We followed the host agreement. Frankly, they kicked the can down the road to you guys. And with all due respect, I'd like to see that you guys take the accountability and don't rely completely on the special permitting process. Um, you have an opportunity now to make sure that appropriate steps are taken. And whether or not this is even an appropriate use for this property. Again, we're not anti-development. We understand. And we knew we moved in across from it. IX zone, but this particular use is of the highest concern to us. And to the points that have been raised about monitoring, monitoring is only as good as enforcement. And without that, very clearly stated, excuse me, could, excuse me, could we just leave our applause till all the members of the public have an app, uh, opportunity to speak, and then if people would like to applause, then please feel free. If you so please continue. Again, I feel that the monitoring language is great, but until you know what entity is responsible for enforcing, what um, steps, whether it's you get a first warning, second warning, a fine, et cetera, because fining a huge corporation, they can pay the, to do the business, and then we're still up the creek. So I think that needs to be much, much more clearly defined and whose responsibility it is. Um, so ultimately, accountability, and it starts here with this commission. Thank you. Thank you. Other members? Yes, we'll take the uh, individual way in back. Yes, you, sir, and then we'll move, uh, we'll move forward. Dave Ellis, 56 Old Lane Road in Wallingford. Um, I'm the board of directors of the Wallingford Land Trust. So the Wallingford Land Trust is actually the biggest abutter to these properties. Um, and I hear a lot of talk in the regulations, proposed regulations, special zone about um, residential uh, restrictions. And of course, that makes sense. A residents, of course, are going to be there 24 7 and care about it. But we also have open space that's next to this property. This property, uh, this open space is one of the most heavily used pieces of property in Wallingford for outdoor recreation. Uh, we have our only natural waterfall in the town right there, and there's always people hiking here. Sir, if, if you could, what property are you speaking about? Oh, this will be the, I'm sorry, the Orchard Glen property. Um, it's off Barnes Industrial Road North is the access point, but it goes right between the Merritt Parkway and the IX zone. Um, so admittedly, the, the parkway is near it, so we're not talking about a pristine wilderness like in the middle of Maine. There is ambient noise. but. We don't want the experience of walking into the waterfall to be on one side the parkway and the other side Bradley International Airport. So I think that the regulation for the special permit needs to also specify setbacks for open space, and especially open space that has been, in some, in some sense, developed as an outdoor recreational opportunity so that that outdoor recreational opportunity is not, um, you know, wrecked. We've, one of the letters that Mr. LaRue sent you, we've asked for berms. Now we're going to have to send it again to the new owners, whatever they take place. But we would like the regulations to include berms and setback requirements for open space that's used for public recreation. Um, another point is the monitoring and enforcement. Okay, I've, Actually, I'm an IT professional. Um, they rotate equipment in and out all the time. It's not like it's going to stay for three years. The equipment is going to come in and out on a daily basis for these, these places. Monitoring needs to be active, continuous, at least periodically continuous, with a protocol for enforcement and a protocol to pay for it. 
this monitoring is not going to be accomplished by the police department going out with a sound meter. It's going to be done professionally, it's going to be expensive, and someone needs to pay for that. And if we don't figure that out, you're going to have trouble. Okay? So we look for, you know, working with everybody. We, we're, we want to be responsible, just develop responsibly, but we don't want the outdoor recreational opportunities in Wallingford to be destroyed by such a development. That's my comments. Thank you. Good enough. Thank you, sir. Other members of the public? Yes, gentleman right in front, and then we'll go to the gentleman in the back. Michael Polanski, 1039 North Farms Road. This um, question or suggestion harkens back to what Mr. Hines brought up regarding the regulation or the text regarding setbacks. Um, I would like it, uh, the way it stands now, the way I understand it, um, there's really no define what setback you're going to use or property line. For all our neighbors that um, abut the property, ask that it be written that the rear property line that abuts the property in question be used as that point to establish the 500 foot or 700, uh, 750 foot setback. It makes no sense to use the front property line on the street side measure 500 feet back and then use that as established as, well, we use the front property line, but it should be the rear property line that abuts the property in question because that's what we're talking about. Mitigating that distance or expanding that distance that we have to be exposed to this structure that's going to be built that we have to deal with. So if it could be written in the regulation that it's the rear property line that abuts the property in question that's going to be developed, use that as it to be established because we all know that lawyers like to use um, the tear apart uh, weak text and that they say, well, it was just said that a property line, we're going to use the front property line, which makes no sense at all. So I'm just asking for common sense to be brought forward and use the rear property line that abuts that to be written into your text so we're more protected from that developed and I understand that, sir. I think that that's, that's the intention, and we'll certainly make certain that that yes. in, the, in the regulations as they're, uh, uh, as they're modified. Have it that, that, clearly that, that, that would, that defined that would, so there's no... Yeah, that, that, would be, that that would be clear, so there wouldn't be any No ambiguity. question, no. So no. that'd be great. Thank no, you. I understand for, that. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. And again, the gentleman in the back. Good evening. I'm uh, Roger Nork, 77 Midland Drive. Um, I've lived in the neighborhood most of my life. My mom is in the same neighborhood. She's 87. Um, we watched everything happen last number of years. And when uh, the IAC zone was created uh, versus residential area, um, it was created um, by this commission with many, many considerations for the residents and we understand that what could be there, and we appreciate that. And uh, also appreciate the commissions um, moving um, carefully on this. Um, it's obvious the commission, the um, town council moves a little quickly, and I really appreciate the thoroughness that um, we're going with. Um, one question is um, the placement of generators. Um, that's something that can be put in um, to keep the generators farther away from residential properties. Uh, Mr. Pacini, would you like to comment on that, please? Uh, yes, that would be part of the uh, setback requirements as part of the building. So any generators would be considered as part of the building. Depending, I mean, without seeing an application, without knowing where they would be, but that's what, uh, how I would describe that. I mean, we can make it more clear if, uh, it needs to be. And I understand that without seeing an actual application, it's hard to know uh, how they actually present these uh, to a planning commission. So I guess the question would be then you're indicating that it would be a, a minimum of the 500 feet, is that yes. correct? Which, which would be with the building itself, sir? So as far as in front of the building or behind the building, um, that couldn't be regulated as far as how far that would be away from residents? Well, it would. 
Again, I, let, I guess I defer to I'm Mr. Just, I'm, I'm just guessing that they wouldn't put the generators, say, 200 feet away from the building. It doesn't kind of make sense uh, from what we've heard that the generators are generally uh, right next to the building. Well, what I mean is... I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're looking more, uh, if it was put in front of the building, is, is that correct? It would be more visible to the, the front portion of the building, is, is that correct? Or, well, or, or looking to have it more looking to have the generator, if there are residential properties in the area, to have the, the generator behind the building to screen from the residential properties. Is, is that what you're kind of driving at, sir? No, no. Basically, um, to the north is residential and to the south is um, IX. So if it could be on the IX side with the rest of the uh, industrial development, that would be more beneficial to the residents. Yes, Mr. Pagini, uh, you like to comment on? I, I, I guess. No, I, I agree. I just uh, without without seeing an actual application, it's hard to know, you know, where the generators uh, are intended to be. Um, but we had every intention of including them in the building setback, um, if that clarifies it at all. But uh, we could certainly look into placement of generators and uh, writing that in, possibly, uh, if necessary. Would be appreciated. Or I, I guess if I could, Mr. Pagini, that could also be a, I, I guess, a, a condition of a, of a special permit. Is there yes. is, it, if this were to be, if the regulations were to be approved, as we talked about, that would be a special permit. That could quite possibly be a condition of the special permit as far as where that, uh, where the generators have to be located. Because again, a special permit gives the commission a great deal of, of latitude on an application, unlike if it was just, you know, by right. Mm -hmm. So that's something that could be considered at that particular point in time. Okay, that would be great. That would be I beneficial could, to the residents, I'm sure. I could believe, certainly add it as uh, looking at uh, under the documentation uh, for placement of generators, something to that effect. Okay. And um, also uh, receiving this special permit, whatever company brings the application in, gets the special permit, um, and gets everything approved. This is something that came up in the town council meeting also. Can all of those approvals just be turned over to another company that they sell them to? Um, is there anything that says the company that goes through the entire process has to build? There's nothing in the, in the regulations, and again, like with other uh, other projects, uh, you could come in and let's say you want to put a residential development in. You could come in, get your approval for a residential development, and once you have that approval, you know you could uh, you could sell that uh, property to someone else, and you have the approval. Uh, as far as and again, this may be more of a, I guess, a question for uh, for our, our our corporate council because our corporation council. Because with this particular, if it's a larger uh, development that comes under the host agreement, uh, I'm not sure how that would be, you know, would be handled. So perhaps, it, uh, Attorney Small, you could enlighten us all on that. Well, first, land use does not govern ownership, mm -hmm. so you don't have they don't have the power to regulate that from a zoning perspective. So the um, the host agreement does have language and requirements if somebody were to assign the agreement to a new owner. So there's certain requirements they have to, um, and they do have to get the town's consent for that. That's a contractual thing in the host agreement, but it's not a zoning issue. Okay. Okay? They, can't, they can't regulate about ownership. Okay. So when legally, so it, like the chairman said, if, if you brought an application, if you got an application approved for a special permit and you decided to sell the project, so this, the special permit gets transferred to the new owner, all the conditions that you were required to do, they, were, they are required to do. So it would be binding on them. Okay. okay? All right. And again, thank you for your being cautious and trying to protect the residents. We appreciate it. And thank you, sir. And again, on this side of the room, other than this young lady, anyone else on this side of the room? Okay. Well, I'll take the... Uh, Lady in the, no, uh, yes you ma'am, and then the gentleman in front of you. 
and then we'll move to the uh, right side of the room. Jessica Polanski, 1039 North Farms Road. Um, I, I think I just want to first say that for those of us concerned citizens who've been here fighting against this since day one, it's so incredibly alarming when you're asking questions this evening that we asked continuously along the way and answers are still not given. That's incredibly alarming. Um, Mr. Pagini, I'm wondering if you could pull up the illness slide. Yeah. Do you think that depicts the factual... Uh, don't, excuse me, don't address the questions to Mr. Pagini. Please address them to the commission if you would. Okay. Um, well, what I want to say about this is, it, I mean, it's just about the most grossly misleading statement that can be up there. So many of us in this audience have done such extensive research on this topic because this is going to be dumped potentially in our backyards, and it's frightening. So <laughs> I, I guess I want to know why the town of Wallingford chose to conduct a research through this scholarly, scholarly journal database when we've given you so much factual evidence that contradicts that statement, which is an outrageous lie. Well, let's please tone down the language. It's, it's the truth. Well, yeah, it may be the truth, but to call it an outrageous lie. It I is think an it, outrageous lie. I have uh, documentation I, may, may, I, that don't, supports I, what I'm saying. I don't want to get into a discussion with you about that, but I would ask you just to tone your language down. I don't know, Mr. Pagini, would you like to comment on that at all? No, uh, we found no direct link, specifically linking data centers to human illnesses. No. Okay. Um, per perhaps the town of Wallingford's re research should have started and ended with the documented testimony from the live, breathing human beings who are in continuous peril, who are actually already suffering in class action lawsuits and suffering tremendous consequences that these data centers have caused because reckless and irresponsible leaders ignored these people's cries for help. And the safeguards that were promised have turned out to be anything but safe. For instance, December 5th, 2021, Stanton News. This was the headline, Data Center Torture for Chandler Neighborhood over industry set standards that continually fail, regardless that the data centers are operating in compliance. I hope my neighbor Tony is here, and I hope he comes up and basically elaborates on this. Um, you know, you tell me to, to keep my tone down I have an existing condition, and a lot of these existing conditions, that's why this statement is so misleading, because existing conditions are straight across the board, well documented to be severely affected by these data centers. It's nobody's business, but mine happens to be migraine headaches. There's several people in litigation because their migraine headaches have just gone haywire because this noise doesn't shut off. It's not, it's not a joke. Um, so now we move to your minimum 500 to 750 feet setbacks. Are, are we getting back to that? Am I gonna be, I'm a fifth generation resident. My childhood home and my grandparents' home is down the street from where I live. This neighborhood means a lot to me. The 500 and 750 feet setbacks. Do you have any scientific data that they will safeguard us? Yes, they were recommended by the sound engineer. And he will be here next meeting to answer those questions. OK. 
okay. But again, if you do the research, all of the safeguards have failed with all of these other data centers around the country who are supposedly operating in compliance. If, if I could, and again, I don't mean to put Mr. Pagini on the spot, but I, I think some of the data centers, and we can, certainly the, the sound engineer, the acoustical engineer can address some of those, those issues that you have. But I think as pointed out in the slides that, uh, I believe it was the Chandler, Arizona. Again, Mr. Pacini, you can correct me, but there were essentially very little uh, in the way of uh, regulations concerning setbacks, concerning sound, concerning noise. And I think some of the other uh, situations that were found, if you're you know, talking about, say, with, you know, with Chicago, where there was a lot of complaints, that was a data center that was right in the center of Chicago. Uh, amongst a, a, a smaller size building as far as its height, surrounded by you know, other uh, much taller buildings where the sound goes up. So you know, I, I, I can appreciate the fact that uh, in certain areas that they've exper they're experiencing some problems and there you know, perhaps hasn't been any enforcement of that. Uh, but in those areas, there was, I think, when they were approved, there was very little requirements as far as setback screenings or everything, you know, that were there. So I'm not necessarily think that you're comparing what's being proposed here to the regulations that were in place at the time when some of those data centers that you're talking about were approved. I'm not saying that your, your concerns are not valid concerns, but all I'm saying is that uh, there, I think, is a difference in at least what's being proposed here to what was proposed or acted on in some of these other data centers that you're citing. I understand that, but you also have to take into consideration that these are the largest double story monstrosities and they're essentially projected to be dumped in my backyard and I'm not happy about that. I understand that. So I think a lot needs to be taken into consideration. I mean, I can guarantee that the study that he just told me, the sound engineer, as far as the setbacks, was that taken into consideration with people with pre-existing conditions? I that can't. it's already proven okay. in lit court litigation across the country and with, throughout the world? I, I guarantee it's not. Move it back you, than my, from my let's house. Get, let's, let's give the gentleman a chance to answer, please. I can't, I can't speak for the sound engineer, so he will yeah. answer those questions when he is here. Well, I'm going to assume that that's a no, so if he can have that information, that would be valuable to us. I just think that our health, quality of life should not be challenged, altered, compromised, destroyed, especially in our own homes and backyards over business decisions by leaders in positions of power who are supposed to protect us. These leaders are either willful, and then I'm not really saying you, I'm talking more about the town council and even Wallingford Legal, who has yet to get back to me from my letters in June. Um, it's just, all of our concerns have been willfully overlooked or recklessly ignored. And I think I'm speaking for a lot of my neighbors in saying that, because we go round and round in circles, asking questions, never get an answer. And as far as the sound engineer, I just want to make a point because if I'm understanding it in layman's, turn, in layman's terms, he's essentially saying, might be okay, hopefully it'll be okay during the day, but good luck at night. And again, we live in a very quiet, peaceful country setting. We fall asleep with our windows open. We hear tree frogs, owls, crickets wake up to birds singing. Sounds a very little house on the prairie, but that's the beauty of it. And we don't want that aesthetic destroyed. And as far as um, the volume being raised, you know, the volume is not just being raised at 50%. You're raising it and changing it drastically to the most obnoxious and irritating noise that comes from the heaviest of industry. I don't care if the birds sing louder. I care if generators are louder. Have any of you ever been sleeping late on a Sunday morning and you have a neighbor who has a diesel truck running? That's one diesel truck that can turn off or pull out of the driveway. 
please understand the scope and the magnitude and the size of these buildings that have no business being around neighborhoods. Um, you know, like I said, our, our reality, this is our reality, and it's going to be far more damaging than a 50% number that is thrown out as acceptable. Acceptable to whom? Is it acceptable to you if this was in your backyard? If you're used to peace and quiet, do you want to hear obnoxious industry behind you? Again, I grew, I grew up on North Farms Road when it was a single lane dirt road. I can remember that, that far back. And I understand we have change and everybody wants our town to do great, but, but at what expense? You know, everybody's talking about the, the property lines and the distances. The fact that, and, and again, I question the 500 and 700 feet, because over the summer, we were told by Mr. Quinn and Mr. Len Fasano, oh, one fo football field will do it. One football field will do it. And then I asked, what's the scientific proof behind that? And they had none. So everything that they'd been telling us was essentially manipulation. So I have to wonder now, are we being manipulated again? Or is this going to be solidified that we're going to be protected? Because that's why we're stressed out. That's why we are angry. Because when we ask questions and we don't get answers, who's protecting us? Um, as far as the water issues, on May 17th, the City Council of Mesa, Arizona approved an $800 million development of an enormous data center. They quickly learned that keeping the rows of powerful computers inside one data center from, over, from overheating would require approximately 1.25 million gallons of water every day, a price that Mayor Jen Duff believes is way too high. She went on to say, we are on high red alert, and I didn't, and I don't, blah, 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 excuse me, we are on high red alert, and I think data centers are an irresponsible use of our water. What an absolute waste. Is it feasible for our town to supply these data centers with the amount of water they will require? And does anybody know how many millions of gallons of our water every single day per building Wallingford anticipates having to use? Again, I, I, we don't have an application in front of us, but as I think as Mr. Pagini had indicated that the wet cooling is something that's, or the water cooling is, is done in uh, primarily in Arizona in those areas. There would be more dry cooling that would be done here, which wouldn't be the use of water. So I don't know if you'd like to expound upon that, Mr. Pagini, or not. No, that's correct. Um, I don't know the exact uh, everything about every single data center in the entire country, but from what I've read and what I've seen, uh, I guess certain companies like Google use. Uh, water for cooling, and they're mostly out west uh, for those climates. So the, uh, the sound engineer was actually going to speak about that tonight, uh, but because he has more experience in that field. Well, I don't mean to insult you, but if I was in your position and I had residents whose lives were in peril and quality of life was about to be drastically interrupted, I'd know everything about every data center in this country. But that's just me. Um, as far as, so, um, will any of the water issues affect our wells? My house in particular is protected under the Wallingford watershed. And I'm just wondering if we have anything to worry about as far as water issues. Do we need to worry about our wells drying up? Do we need to worry about... Well, I, again, I think Mr. Pagini had indicated that the, the, let me ask you this, Mr. Pacini. Would it be possible to specify that these data centers or a data center would need to use dry cooling and couldn't use any water? Certainly. That can be written in as well. Well, I just think that we are very concerned because when you look at the amount of water that these... I know. He's, in this, he's, he's indicated that he felt that that could be, uh, that that could be uh, a part of the regulation. So... That's a concern. It appears that that concern could be addressed. And I just want, hypothetically thinking, worst case scenario, 
if these somehow get into our veins underneath in our wells and our wells become depleted and dry out and we essentially have to dig a new well who's liable if what again i'm not well we we just again we we do not receive the answers that we need so i'm saying worst case scenario if any of our neighbors if, if our wells are affected to the point of Effect, being affected by what if, if, by vibrations by noise or, or if they end up having to dig to supply themselves with more water i, I believe though mr pagini just indicated that it would be uh, possible to put into the regulations again don't put words in my mouth mr pagini that it could be that you could our, our regulation could limit the cooling to dry cooling is that correct yes so if that if that could if that could be done and if it's done then there wouldn't be any you know digging to get water and depleting and your wells can't? excuse me and what if it can't if what can't what if the system that you're speaking of they determine because these buildings are so enormous well but if it's part of our regulations where they have to have a dry cooling if they can't meet the dry cooling they can't meet the regulation okay i, I think i understand what you're saying um and i keep hearing about got space and um the host agreement um is it Tom Quinn of the Verde Group, Tom Quinn of Ocean? Again, we're not talking about God's space in the host agreement here. What we're talking well, I'm about, just wondering I, excuse me, if I could finish, please. What we're talking about is a regulation for to consider data, spa, uh, data centers in certain zones. That's what's being considered as far as you know, an agreement that may or may, not, may, or may not be out there. It's, it's not the commission's purview. No, I understand that, but we're just, you know, as residents, we're trying to really understand how fast this is coming. And I know that Mr. Quinn has not acquired the mass majority of the land yet behind me. And with that said, and that's why I was asking, is it Tom Quinn of Verde Group, Tom Quinn of Ocean State Developers, Tom Quinn of Godspace, Tom Quinn of NE Edge LLC, um, if he is operating under another um, company right now, does the host agreement get wiped out and do they have to reapply? And I guess I, I would ask uh, attorney, uh, attorney Small if you could perhaps answer that question. The agreement is with Godspace. If someone else wants it for a different piece of property, that would be a different agreement. If, God's, if Godspace is um, not the company purchasing the land in this when because the whoever is going well we have a, an agreement with Godspace Godspace doesn't that agreement doesn't talk about who's buying the land mm -hmm. but it does identify the properties that Godspace would be able to use the host fee agreement for so if that changes that would affect that if Godspace look to um, assign the agreement that requires town consent um, I guess I'm just asking that if the if he defaulted on the previous contract with the landowners and he's entering into a new contract with the landowners owners under a new company, would that mean he could still operate under that host agreement or does he possibly need to not? It would really we'd have to take a look at the facts. Um, Mr. Pagini, if I was too hard on you, I apologize. And the same to the council. It's just very emotional to get up here as often as we do and not understand certain things and, and not have adequate information given back to us. I appreciate you just explaining that. I, explain, I understand it a little better. Um, so as far as... I just want to like really I probably am going to sit down and have a million things pop in my head that I wish I said um, but I just really hope that this Commission does their due diligence because we really were failed and underserved by the Town Council um, so many of us begged and pleaded with them to not rush this and to put pause and I know it got dumped in your lap but we really and truly um, 
just had so many questions and so many people in the neighborhood didn't know about this. And we asked them to push pause. They rushed it through. Um, and I just, I think I just, just popped in my mouth, in my uh, head as far as, um, as far as the location of these, why is it that the data centers are taking precedence over living, breathing human beings raising their families in our community, in these residential neighborhoods? Why can't the, the for safety and well-being of us, why can't the, the data centers be limited in number? And why can't they be decreased if it means safeguarding the residents? Is that something that's possible or it's it's not possible? Well, it's entirely possible during the special permit process when we actually get an application. And if it, I, I guess I just have another question. Um, in regards to me saying why are they taking precedence over us, why is it that they're 500 or 700 feet from our property line, hopefully at least the back property line, why aren't they seeing there are these monstrosities that are just going to be so loud and obnoxious and omitting sound that nobody wants to hear, why can't they be put more on top of each other in kind of a cluster? And especially seeing it sounds like there's not a lot of people that go there, probably because it's unhealthy to be around that sound. On a daily basis, I would assume there's got to be some serious protective gear worn. Um, but but why is why is that? Why is it that they can't be clustered together more? Well, I, again, I guess Mr. Pagini, you could answer that question, but I'm not sure if there's a uh, there's a limitation as far as how close they can be to one another, provided you know they meet the various setbacks and, and what have you. So. Yeah, that would be all discussed as part of the an application. Uh, there is no application, so I can't speak on to as to what would be in front of us. Would the limit as far as the closeness with them and proximity to each other be something that would be a hazard to the public? Because if it's not a hazard to the public, I would certainly hope that living, breathing human beings raising their families in our community would take precedence over buildings. Absolutely, I agree. So maybe that's something. You know, like I said, we all want the town to succeed, but we don't want to spend the rest of our lives. You know, my husband and I have killed ourselves to create a beautiful home for our kids. You know, hopefully our grandkids come back. This is the time where we're supposed to be enjoying life, getting to that point. You enjoy the fruits of your labor, and then this comes into your purview, sure. and it's horrible. We understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I believe there was a gentleman, yes, uh, this gentleman right behind you. You'll be next, sir, and then uh, you'll be next. Yes, you, sir. My name is Ron Maturo, 1009 North Farms Road. I am a retired electrician. I work the nuclear power plants in Connecticut. I see what could happen here. Um, what I, I don't know, this thing working or what? Oh yeah, we have you loud and clear, sir. <clears throat> you may want to just step back just maybe a, we'll see how that is. Okay, can you hear me? I can, yes, sir. All right, anyways, um, <clears throat> talking about these uh, data systems, what they are, is computers. Well, back in the 60s, I worked with my brother-in-law, uh, <coughs> IBM, George Street, New Haven, and they have to keep those buildings cold because the computers generate so much heat, they have to keep the temperature down around 60. So that means you need air conditioners. And not only we're going to have the data systems making noise, we're going to have big air conditioners to bring the decibels of the sounds. 
So that's not a good idea. Also, I noticed Northeast Utilities is putting new power lines behind us across North Farms Road. Well, obviously, those power lines are coming from Millstone Unit 3. Well, guess where they're going to go? To your buildings. There's no way Wallingford is going to supply this electricity. They could never, never generate enough power. So it's going to come out of Millstone. And also, just for kicks and giggles, years ago, I had a fluorescent light bulb at night. I brought it underneath the power lines, and do you know it lit because of the phosphorus in the tube? So that means people and animals are getting charged up with this electricity, believe it or not, and that will affect our health. So it's not very good to have all this going on. So again, we're going to have a lot of noise with the units. We're going to have a lot of noise with the generators, I mean the air conditioning units, because I've installed and repaired air conditioning, central air in people's homes. Uh, they make a lot of noise, okay? So you got to add that to it, to the equation. So we have a big problem here, real big. As uh, far as, um, what else did I want to, the wavelength bothers your uh, uh, animals, mostly female women and animals, they hear a higher decibel than a male, so they'll get affected more. Um, of course, men, males are more on the bassy side, where females are on the higher side. Uh, let's see, health issues, I did that. Um, something else I want to say, something about, is it true that these company is coming to Wallingford and they're going to get not taxed for 30 years? Is that a fact? Okay, and I don't know if that is true. Who can answer that one? There is, a, I'm sure Attorney Small can answer it, but I'll give you the cliff notes on it. It's my understanding that they are uh, they're not taxable for a, uh, an agreement that was, or, or legislation it was uh, done by the state uh, for 30 years. However, depending upon, sir, you just you can lower your chin a little bit. Don't you, don't be too surprised here now. Uh, that uh, depending upon the size of the uh, the buildings, the number of megawatts, uh, I believe the amount in annual not taxes but payment in lieu of taxes could approach on one building about a million dollars. But Attorney Small, if you'd like to perhaps give a little insight into that. The state passed a law in order to entice data centers to Connecticut, basically saying if you commit a $200 million investment, um, they're not taxed. So that's by state law. They don't pay any taxes except they do have to, in order to come to a town, you have to enter into a host fee agreement and make a payment to the town um, in order to come here. So that's what it's, it's a state law that did that. Okay, um, are they gonna pay taxes to Wallingford? Is Wallingford gonna get any taxes out of this? They're making a payment gonna... instead of taxes, in lieu of taxes, because the state statute so, says they're not to be taxed. No, say that again, please, I didn't understand. So the state law, made them tax exempt. They don't pay any kind of tax. I'm talking about the town. I you know, but that's it, part of the state law. However, the state set law says that if they want to go into a certain town, they do have to enter into agreement whereby they pay the town something. It's, well, it's a fee instead of, it's not technically a tax. Okay, so are, so are they going to pay, and what I want to know is, is they going to pay anything to Wallingford to help Wallingford in 
I, I think, again, now. sir, you've asked the question, and she's, That's answered, okay. the, and she, so, and she's answered the question. Okay. Yes, they will be paying, and sir, let me finish, please. They'll make a payment in lieu of taxes. That payment, I'm not sure if that, what that is under the host agreement, but at least from what I read in the paper, that depending upon the size of the building, that payment in lieu of taxes per year per building could be up to a million dollars. So they are paying, while it's not a tax, it's a payment in lieu of taxes, which comes to Wallingford. How does well, Wallingford benefit money-wise? Well, I, I would say that if a business has to pay in lieu of taxes a million dollars to Wallingford, Wallingford benefits by seeing a million dollars deposited into its town account. A million dollars? Is this so total? I'm not gonna get, we're, we're not getting into the specific dollar amount, but what I'm, the point I'm, the, sir, the point I'm trying to make is while they don't, as the attorney small indicated, while they don't pay taxes, they have to make a payment in lieu of taxes, which is negotiated with the town. Well, I think that as far as residents like me, the residential, we should pay less taxes with this people coming in to pay some of our share. Well, sir, that's your opinion, and you're certainly entitled to it. Well, somebody's making money here, and it's not me. Thank you. You're most welcome, uh, welcome, sir, and I look forward to seeing you at next meeting. Yes, the uh, young lady in front, please. Director Evgenia May, 76 Tankwood Road. Good evening, everybody. Good, good evening to the commissioners, to the neighbors, to the members of the Excuse public. me, if you could just slow down just a little bit, I'd appreciate that. Oh, that was just introduction. So oh, okay. Yes, I just go through. Right. And I also would like to commend uh, Mr. Pergini and the team uh, for their diligent work on this. We know this is unprecedented. No municipality, either in Connecticut, New England, or it seems in the whole country, ever attempted. Uh, a project like this, so it's challenging by nature of its uniqueness. Um, and we appreciate that difficulty. Um, with this said, I would like uh, to dwell a little bit on the setbacks. I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding of residents' concerns in regards to the setbacks. Any particular number doesn't concern us uh, per se. It concerns us in terms how much of a mitigation can be achieved by, way, by ways of this number. If 500 feet, or 500 feet for the buildings, I guess, that's proposed in the new regulation results in five decibel increase of the uh, permanent background noise, that's what we are really looping at. Uh, the previous version of the regulation was calling for uh, no significant impact, I believe. And so, again, uh, interrupt me if this is, uh, should be better addressed by the sound engineer, or at least this can, the framework can be addressed by Mr. Pagini. But through you, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask Mr. Pagini whether he can give us a clear example those five decibels, is it two times more? Is it 10% more? Uh, what is it in perceptible impact? Sure. I, I think Mr. Pagini could perhaps give you an answer, but I, I, candidly, I think the sound engineer yeah. would probably be able to give you a much more definitive answer. So I, I think that would be much more appropriate mm -hmm. you know, to, to have the sound engineer rather than Mr. Pagini and... I, I so we'll save it for the next one then? Yes, yeah. I, I think that would be much more appropriate. Okay, and so if a sound engineer is going to make an appearance at the next meeting, um, probably there is something can be done to save time. Um, so in the, so in the uh, letter addressed uh, to the corporate council dated uh, January 5th, um, the sound engineer provided two models uh, of how the impact of five decibels would be uh, perceived audible in two certain kinds of neighborhoods. And my understanding is that um, 
the neighbor, because the daytime sound comes mostly from the traffic, the difference between neighborhoods and how much impact for how many hours a day will really be perceptible to those residents is dictated by the distance from major highways. Uh, I've noticed that both of those models take into consideration distances such as 900 feet or 1,500 feet from major highways. Um, our neighborhood is very different. We are 3,000 feet from uh, 15, we're 4,000 feet from I-91. So our baselines are very different. We don't have daytime noise that will rise versus the uh, back, um, background noise during the night. Um, in this case, uh, should it be useful? Uh, can it be asked by the commission for the sound engineer to prepare a similar model, but for actual neighborhood in Ajax. For example, take Tankwood and Midland, in intersection of those two roads, uh, see how far away they are from the freeway, and how much noise do they get during the day. Because I think the whole perception of a sound consultant, the sound engineer here, is, is five decibels will be only audible for very few hours during the night because during the day you will get the traffic to cover it up, basically. It seems like, and Mr. Pagini can correct me if my perception is wrong. Yeah, he was actually going to expand on that uh, during the meeting, so I don't want to speak for him, uh, but he did bring that up. Okay, so perfectly, uh, it probably will help us if he models the same for our particular type of neighborhood because the neighborhood is on a different scale of quietness. He just sure. gave uh, examples of available data that he had. Uh, uh, just different distances from the freeways. So just say if it's a neighborhood that's four, five, uh, six thousand feet from, uh, like for my house, it would be three and four thousand feet from the highways mm -hmm. and uh, two thousand feet from North Farms. I'm not sure what's called uh, town archer, uh, archery, like what's Seriously. qualified, or it's yes. 68, which is seven thousand feet. My concern here is that, speaking about um, compl uh, preserving the character of the neighborhood and compatibility with the neighborhood, our neighborhood is on a different scale of quietness. We are different type. And unfortunately, I think for that development to mitigate in our neighborhood is a challenge. And if it can be done, wonderful, perfect. If it can be done with a set setback of 100 feet, it's fine as well. But it seems like, according to the engineer, we're still going to experience a very significant, significant increase in noise. Uh, on logarithmic scale, it might be very significant. I, again, we'll wait for the engineer to expand on that. Um, this is as far and everything else probably should wait for the sound engineer to be here to save everybody's time. Um, my other concern is the commission is relying on the mechanism of special permit to safeguard uh, the residents. Um, in the meantime, the regulations already set a certain top off. It's going to be plus something. You got, you're not going to be guaranteed, and before it used to say, no substantial impact. So by putting that into regulation, commission already surrenders the discretion to require full mitigation. And referring to uh, five research parkway application by Montante, not because it was denied, but because it's the most recent, the most relevant, where it's located, it's the same zone, it also abutted neighborhood, very closely. So the circumstances are very similar. Similar, And um, precedent from that application was that during the uh, special permit, uh, the applicant was basically uh, compelled to achieve full mitigation in sound, right? They came before the commission without the sound wall. They were allowed use. They were within the um, zone requirements. At the same time, they were compelled to uh, suggest mitigation 
buffer mitigation to go to complete mitigation, basically, to the wall. Um, and on the traffic, unfortunately, full mitigation was not available, and the commission said no, didn't feel comfortable with allowing it. Um, and I wonder why for data centers here, commission is inclined to waive that discretion to require full mitigation. The developers, however much money Google has, they will not offer best mitigation available unless they are compelled. They won't spend extra money on that. And it seems here, commission already says, okay, uh, it's gonna be worse. I wonder why. But uh, again, I, and again, Mr. Pacini, you could probably comment on this a little bit, but looking at that application that you're referring to, uh, they were required to meet the sound requirements of the town, whatever that was for the particular zone, correct? Yes. They needed to, uh, they need to mitigate to those uh, requirements. That's what they needed to do. What's being proposed here, if, certainly if I understand it, and I, I think I do, uh, you're taking the background noise and figuring, factoring out certain things and then saying they can increase the 5 dBs. Uh, they can't go over what the uh, sound requirements are for the various districts. Correct? Correct. So I, I guess a case in point, and just as, let's say the, the background noise in this particular case was 30 dBs. They could go, and again, jump in here if I'm wrong. 35. They can go to 35 yes. in the zone, and I'm not sure what the uh, requirement is for this particular zone, but I believe it's... 51. Could it, excuse me? 51. Yeah, so it's 51. So they can't go to 51. They're required. They would be set at that 35, where what you're referring to is if in that particular application, if it was background was 30 dBs, they could go up to the 50 or the 55, whatever it might have been required in that zone. So when we say full mitigation, they had to show that they could not go over that if it was 55 dBs for that particular zone. So that was... For Montante, Chair? Excuse me? You mean yes. for Montante? I, I, you mean for the, uh, for the five research parkway application? Is that the one you're... Yes, that's, that's the one I think you're referring to. Yes, but I yeah. think uh, in the end of the day, with the introduction of a sound wall, they showed that there will be no increase in either con continuous or impulse sound at the nearby residential property. I, they if, may have. I'm not sure if they did. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you're not, not, not wrong. But I, I my just, recollection is correct. We listened to that. Like you, you may very well, your recollection may be better than mine. I, I, but, I, uh, I'm sorry. No, no I, I'm sorry. So Please continue. I think my point here is that why at the time of allowing that use in the zone, we're already compromising. We're already saying we're going to take a hit. In five to ten years when this thing is going to be built, there might be technology available for complete mitigation. I wonder why the commission would surrender that discretion now and allow an increase. An increase seems to be large, but again, we will wait for the uh, sound engineer to talk about it. I'm speaking about the principle. Mm -hmm. okay. The commission has a discretion with a special permit. Like, first of all, this use is not allowed. There is a permanent noise source that might be not compatible with residential. And it, if it is allowed, it needs to be safeguarded, right? When the zone was designed, obviously data centers were not there. The nuisance, the continuous nuisance that it represents to human beings was not, uh, could not be anticipated. And so that zone was not designed with that use in mind, obviously. So now Google comes, trillion dollar company. It might cost them a few hundred million, oh, $10 million more to implement full mitigation. So why would the commission and the town of Wallingford surrender that right to require full mitigation? It came from no substantial impact 
down to five decibels, which is on logarithmic scale, is close to 50% increase in the noise. If 10 decibels is double, it's 50%. Um, if the gas prices went up from two to three dollars, we would notice. If your work week increased from five days to seven and a half, you would notice. If your significant other grew overnight from six to nine feet, I don't think you would escape noticing that. So again, it's a lay person. Uh, Mr. Cohen suggested that a uh, sound engineer makes a demonstration for us, so, but just on a common sense level, to me, 50%, it is substantial. So I wonder why at this point already the Commission surrenders its right, its discretion to require full mitigation. And then we're all happy. We have a safeguard. I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just looking for something to probably be considered by the Commission and uh, abusing everybody's patience. Uh, just a very quick question, uh, if I could, through you, uh, Chair, to Attorney Small, uh, as you hear, um, you mentioned that um, host agreement, I'm the girl who tr tortured you with the questions at 1 a.m. about what will apply. So it probably will be much easier if it's person to person. So um, you mentioned that the agreement specifically says that the strictest set of rules apply. Which article is it? So that nothing in our agreement prevents the Planning and Zoning Commission from being stricter in their requirements. Okay, I must mm -hmm. have misunderstood. Now, Attorney Small, in your opinion, for example, in that Article 27 that kind of dips the toes into the area of responsibility of a Planning and Zoning Commission and deals with the building size, noise, setbacks, and such. In that article, for example, uh, the building was 45 feet all plus overhead structures are allowed. For example, developer, he makes it, he leaves another day, um, he comes with an application for a special permit and requests and requests a building of 45 square, I'm sorry, feet tall. That he is entitled by the agreement. But the commission, under the discretion of special permit, says, uh uh, neighboring building are too small. Anyways, only 30 feet. What would have travelers? They, are, they have to do it at 30 feet. Perfect. Second question. The noise protocol. Also in the agreement, in the same article 27, there is a parallel noise protocol describing the same, establishing the background noise, uh, having an expert uh, bring a model. And when I ask the question about who is going to be uh, reviewing those models and what would be the process. I ask, with, will it be P and Z? And you answered, it's going to be administration the, uh, as represented by legal department and not necessarily public hearing. And it seems to me, if I remember correctly, that there was like a so whole perils protocol so laid out here. When, when they're designing their project, they would have to first show the town that they meet whatever the, uh, the agreement calls for. So they would, that would include looking at the sound from a contractual between the town and them. They then would come to planning and zoning and have to comply with whatever planning and zoning is requiring. I would assume, since I believe, and the expert will say, that draft of the sound is tighter than the agreement is, that they would look to design to the more strict standard. I mean, it's to their advantage to do that. What is uh, the function of your review, Attorney Small? Are you approving? I, I, no, we're going to rely upon experts. I understand, but yeah. you will be probably coordinating, because t who is going to be whoever who representing town in this process of preliminary I review? I would think it would be several departments. It may include engineering. I, I'm not, it may include engineering. Um, it would be so those parties, whoever they are, um, what is their function? Are they approving? Are they just being informed? What we would be looking for hiring the expertise to tell us
whether or not the design that's being proposed meet what we've agreed to. That's what we'd be doing. Would you consider the standards, if it's an, because it's an alternative set of requirements, mm -hmm. in your review, will you be considering this set of requirements that PNZ is introducing? I would think that we would say to the applicant, I'm not sure why they'd show us a design that didn't meet the stricter the planning and zoning. They have to get passed through planning and zoning. It, it doesn't matter whether we agree with what they did or not. So they have to satisfy planning and zoning regulations. So I would expect when they show their design to the town that it complies with both. Well, that would seem reasonable. Just to me, it sounds I mean, it'd be like a waste of time for them to do yeah, it otherwise. It's like, it's like a double process. I, I'm just trying to figure out what's the purpose of having separate departments reviewing the same application, and it seems like these standards are different from those standards, and whether, from my perspective, the concern is whether that will create a loophole for any applicant to claim that they're compliant with certain steps, and then they that can, one They cannot do that. Okay. They cannot so do that. Planning and zoning has planning and zoning authority. They cannot do that. The whole purpose of putting that provision in the host agreement was to give us a contractual basis to say they didn't do something properly, and then they've got a $200 million investment at risk because they violated the contract. It was thought to be an extra prote protection. It was thought to have the discussion regarding how they were going to protect the sound to be at the earliest possible stage, which the commission can't do. They're gonna get a plan from the application. They're gonna come see us before that. So when they do, we're going to have the zoning regs in front of them. They're going to have them themselves. I mean, it makes no sense for them to create a plan that doesn't comply with this body's rules, well, that, which are going to be stricter. That certainly sounds like that. Would it, in your mind, Attorney Small, would it benefit host agreements just to reference compliance with planning and zoning regulations as they stand or will be adopted at the time, blah, 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 is required as a term of this agreement? Will that be simpler? So the agreement does say that nothing in that agreement prohibits the Planning and Zoning Commission to have uh, more restrictive uh, Setbacks, though. I read it as specifically addressing the... Um, we, don't need a, we don't need an agreement to tell, us, tell them that they have to comply with Planning and Zoning. We don't need that. That's, that's the law. Okay. No, my concern is just because the agreement is in place and Planning and Zoning in a, in a place the contradiction, if it's not clearly, if nothing clearly says what takes legal precedent, and I, I agree on the setbacks, it's very clear that any other um, department can set. That uh, contract cannot legally trump a regulation adopted by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Thank you, very comforting. Uh, then no further, and I'll save my long list for the uh, sound engineer. Thank you, everybody, uh, for your thank attention. You. Other commission, uh, excuse me, other members of the public would like to speak on the application. Yes, this uh, woman back here. Uh, other, uh, while she's coming up to the front, may I have a show of hands of other people that would like to speak? Okay, we'll continue with the uh, individuals in the back, move toward the front, then we'll go to the uh, right side. Deborah DeLillo, 22 Tankwood Road. Um, we're a newbie. We moved in in August. We took a house that sat there for quite a few years and we're revamping it and trying to help our neighbors' property values. Um, I'd like to first of all thank you because this has been a very interesting process um, and you letting us talk. I'm going to keep this a little bit shorter and cutting out a lot of my stuff because Danielle hit on a lot of my um, points. One of them being, why don't we just knock out having these data centers come? I mean, no matter what I've read, no matter what I've seen, they're a headache. They're noisy. They're just not compliance to... Um, the kind of neighborhood that we have. The other thing too is with the changes of technology so fast, 
how long do we think we're going to need data centers? Um, we may be going through all this stuff and money, because I mean, all your um, research and all your um, work you're doing, they could be completely outdated by the time they even get this thing built. Um, I always go back to eight tracks. We thought that was like the coolest thing. Well, how long did they last? And look at how far we've come. So that's another thing that kind of upsets me. Um, maybe in 20 years with the tax exempt, we may not even need them. We may be building these things and having empty buildings just sitting there. That would be a shame. Um, do we have a plan for the wildlife that will be displaced? The hall, I, and I know this is probably like a tree hugger type thing, but I have to bring this up because since we have lived there, the amount of wildlife is unbelievable. Now, we came from Northford. We butted up against a water company property. We never saw the wildlife that we see living across the street from us now. Um, we have the bald eagles. We have families of them. Who do we make sure, or whose responsibility is to make sure that the Connecticut General State status, section 26 to 93, for their protection is followed? I mean, how does that fall in? Um, we have the, the hawks. The hawks are on a comeback. Without the hawks who eat snakes, rats, mice, and other nuisance, they'll start under, overrunning our neighborhood. At first, I thought this was kind of comical when I was reading it. But then, I really found out that this is quite a problem. <laughs> um, there's about 175 acres of land that houses many species of birds, lots of rabbits, a very large herd of deer. And as Danielle said, where do we move the coyote populations? I mean, are we loading them up and like spreading them out in Wallingford? These are things that I think that we have to also address because now are we gonna to have to put money off to the side for more animal control? So as I look at it, you have your million dollars a year that they're going to be paying the town but then I sit there and I see, okay, we gotta deduct for this, we gotta deduct for this, we gotta deduct for that. Um, I also have to, uh, somebody else already asked this, so I'll skip this over. Um, if we decide to move forward, what are we gaining? Um, what is our neighborhood going to gain? Um, the Connecticut Mayor.org, dated 9-12-2021, said that Besides a loss of sale and property taxes, we're getting a million dollars a year, but take away everything else, what are we getting? They only have 20 to 30 permanent employees, and I did, you know, re-emp on that. The amount of power usage, the loss of our property value, the loss of wildlife, and the loss of quality of life. I think we're all in agreement that something is going to go on that property. I can accept that. I think we can all accept that knowing that, you know, they can do whatever they want to do with the property. I honestly and truly within my heart cannot accept a data center. I don't think it's fair for any of us to listen to that noise 24 seven. I don't think it's fair for any of us with all the unknowns. We don't know what's gonna to happen to us um, unless you're gonna take that million dollars and put it off to the side so that if my husband and I do start showing signs of issues from health, you know, health issues, are you gonna pay me for my medical bills? Are you gonna you know, pay me, um, pay us for the losses that we're going to have? I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you, we bought this house also with the thought of, well, if one of us have to go to a nursing home or something, there's our money. Well, guess what? You guys are knocking my money right down to almost nothing. And that's not fair as a resident to Wallingford. Um, I do you know, want to thank you again. I do have one though suggestion for you, sir. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Virginie. 
you, Jeannie. Could you redo your slides with a little darker background? Because we couldn't read anything that was on them. They were great slides, but you, you just need to. Okay. Yeah, it's I'll a teacher that came out and did, sorry. <laughs> um, but other than that, I mean, I've been impressed with how you are handling this. I think everybody, you've let me meet all of our neighbors. So that, I thank you. But more than anything, let's just get rid of the thought of a data center. Let's go back to the drawing board and coming up with something else that is not going to put the town of Wallingford in a position which I really feel that you're going to be putting yourself in. Thank you. Sure, if I could just suggest, if you'd like to take a copy of the slides, oh. they're oh, I, right on that table. And I'm not picking on you by any means. Sure. It's just that you no. couldn't see. They were a little bit too light. Sure enough. Thank you. Take and the uh, gentleman in the back. And then the uh, young lady next to him would be next, and then we'll move forward. Hi, Nick Watrous, 183 Pinehurst Drive. A um, couple things. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your, it just, I think it reflects to the residents in the area just that you've asked a lot of the questions that we've been asking since this was first introduced. Um, it shows that you care and concerned about the livelihood of those who are in the area and who are potentially the most affected. So we appreciate that because um, that in itself speaks you know, volumes to me. Um, I do have some questions, and I'm sorry if some of them have already been addressed. Um, one was I know that a lot of um, attention has been brought to the sound, but then also if there is an issue with vibration, are those issues also brought to the police? I know it was mentioned that if there was a noise issue, it would be handled through the police through a noise ordinance. Is the same true for vibration issues? My understanding would be that it would be. And again, I don't know, Jeannie, I think you can confirm that, can you? Or I'm guessing anything to do with uh, yeah, vibration or sound would be enforced by the police. Um, I don't know the exact equipment you would need, but I'm guessing that you know if it's causing vibration levels, uh, that people are complaining about, we can maybe force the uh, applicant or business owner to uh, do a study and see if that's actually happening uh, or not. So I don't have a, I don't have anything to go off of on this, but that's what I'm, uh, would guess would happen. Okay. And then to piggyback off of some of the comments from Mr. Fitzsimmons earlier, and as well as Mr. Hine, um, one of the concerns I have too is just how it's going to be enforced. If there's all these um, regulations that have to be met. Um, is there now or is there the intention to have in the documentation first that the occupants are the ones paying for the, um, the tests to be done in terms of making sure that all the requirements are met? And then also if, um, well, let's start with that. Is, is that something that's already being looked at? And if so, then are there plans to have specifics in terms of protocol for if they're not meeting it, exactly what is the next step to make sure that all the, in terms of even timeline, do they have a certain amount of time by which those changes or whatever is not being satisfied does get satisfied by? I, I guess if you're, you know, I'll let Mr. Pacini have, answer after I do, but I think the, if there, if there was an application, the application was approved. In order to gain a certificate of occupancy, in order to be able to operate, they would have to, uh, at the discretion of the commission, because again, that's a special permit, the commission could require that they go out and perform the testing on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, on the operation of the, uh, of the building uh, at its maximum capacity. They would have to demonstrate that they have met what they said uh, that the, uh, how, the, how the business was going to operate. So they would have to do that prior to gaining a certificate of occupancy and, being, and be able to operate on a full-time basis. I guess my question is more regarding to the future. Let's say they meet all the initial requirements and everything looks good, but you know, I had an 86 Skyhawk that didn't sure. keep mm -hmm. up with the noise that I would have liked. So. I understand that over time things break down and things might need to be changed, but I'm just wondering if there will be guidelines that within a certain time frame, if 
there is something that on some of the HVAC equipment or whatever that causes more noise than was originally. Well, again, yeah, I think it's what is explained by, I think, Mr. Pagini and perhaps also Attorney Small that uh, once, it, once it meets it's the initial requirements, they get their certificate of occupancy. If there are then complaints that come as far as the amount of noise, then that would be investigated initially by you know, our, our police department and to see if in fact they're violating that or not. And depending on what comes of that, there is a, uh, other actions that uh, could be and hopefully would be taken by the town. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then one other point was, um, I know Mr. Fitzsimmons had talked about not wanting to wordsmith, but that's kind of my jam, I like wordsmithing. So um, I know that one of the things that was mentioned was neighboring um, areas and neighboring, the neighborhood basically. Uh, I, I think that it is important to have some sort of specific, you know, residential areas within half mile, quarter mile, whatever would seem reasonable because anybody who's right up against that property is gonna be complaining if it's going as far as a quarter mile or a half mile. So I think that that would eliminate some of the vagueness and ambiguity that I think is concerning to some of the folks too. Um, the more specific we can be, the more, um, I think the more enforceable things are and also the more comfortable it'll make everybody feel. Okay. So, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Yes, and now the uh, young lady in the back. Kelly Watrous, 183 Pinehurst Drive. Um, thank you, I promise I'll be um, short. Um, I was just curious, in the proposed guidelines, it mentions a sound and vibra vibration impact analysis, but then it mentions everything about sound and nothing about vibration, and I was just curious how vibration is measured. And I know, you know that might be a question for the sound engineer. Well, we'll give Mr. Pagini a shot at that uh, initially and then uh, follow up with the uh, sound engineer. Well, it does mention, uh, determines jurisdictional limits for noise and vibration and proposes noise and vibration control concepts. So as far as how it's measured, I can't speak to that. But uh, we do mention it, and he has mentioned that it does get put into a study. Okay, because I had seen that it said um, that there shouldn't be any vibration that's perceptible. I was just also curious if there is then a vibration, is there equipment that the police would have? I know you had said that there's equipment that they would use um, to detect sound, but is there equipment that they would use to detect vibration as well? I don't know. I'd have to ask them. But we'll follow, we'll uh, follow that question. Follow that up. Thank you. And um, this is something, you know, very minimal, but I did notice in the host agreement that they did mention something about light pollution, and there's not anything in the guidelines that mentions light pollution, and I was wondering if that was anything that anybody had thought of putting in something about any kind of light pollution. Well, we have regulations, uh, light regulations that restrict, uh, that, 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 that deal with uh, lighting of uh, all facilities, so that's part of our general uh, zoning regulations, if you would. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And we'll go to the uh, gentleman up front. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to circle back here. I know everybody's talking about a particular project, but I'm concerned with small data centers. Uh, if you go on the internet and type in data centers in Wallingford. One of the headlines uh, is uh, 30 best data centers in Wallingford, Connecticut. We have a data center over in Barnes Park. It's fairly large. It has the generators, it has the cooling system, and it, it's not what we're talking about here, or what everybody's talking about uh, on North Barnes Road, but it's there, it's existing, and what happens to these projects that come in that, you know, they're good-sized projects, will they have to meet all of these regulations? Um, even if they're, you know, small, if somebody wants to invest a million dollars in a small data center, are they going to have to meet all of these regulations? Mr. Pagini, if you'd like to answer that, please. 
Uh, this is yeah. This was brought up before, uh, but I believe yes, that would be the case. Uh, we couldn't define an actual you know, limit as far as what would be what would be in terms of considering one smaller than another. Uh, we asked the sound engineer, and he had no advice as to how to separate the two. Um, but we don't. We didn't believe that you know there would be a huge demand for for smaller data centers. Um, if they are part of, say, an office, it would be more of an office use. Um, these are these are a certain threshold that you know have accessory electrical substations with them. Uh, so because uh, yeah, like as he mentioned, there are smaller facilities, but they're considered as an office use. I'm going to say they wouldn't be considered a data center because then they wouldn't be allowed. Correct. Yeah. Full. Yeah, full, these are referring to the large, full-fledged uh, ones that with ele accessory electrical substations. So he is correct. So we have discussed that, but uh, we didn't have a, a firm threshold as to how to define that. But I know we have one property owner in Barnes Park that's looking to expand 20,000 square feet strictly for data center. Now they're not surrounded by a residential at all. Um, but they're there, and I, I think it would be cumbersome for them to, to have to apply you know, to follow all these. It just doesn't make sense. Actually, we could lose. You know, I mean, and I, I know you guys have a real tough job accommodating everybody, mm -hmm. but the whole circle here all night and for the last few months has been around this one big project, and, and that's not what the regs say. They say data centers. And like I say, you go on the internet, it tells you the 30 best data centers in, in Wallingford. I don't have an answer. <laughs> At this point in time, I don't have an answer either. If, but I, could, uh, if it, I could also answer to uh, weed out accessory uses, we defined a data center as a principal use, so it would have to be the principal use of the property. That might help, but you're going to have to define it somehow. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that correct if that takes care of everybody in the center and on the left. So now we'll go to the right. And let's start from gentleman in the back and then we'll move forward. Excuse me, uh, ma'am, would you like to, is there anyone behind the gentleman who has his arm up? Okay, we'll take, uh, ma'am, we'll take you first and then we'll move forward. At 18 Tankwood Road, or at least I think it is. I'm really tired. I know you guys are. I want to thank you for your patience and listening to all of us. We've had a lot to say. Some of it's redundant, but you know we're going to have to live with this, so that's why. Um, I know this sounds like a typical not in my neighborhood kind of complaint. Really, we don't want this in anybody's neighborhood. That's really the God's honest truth. This thing is going to be in the middle of the neighborhood. There's really no getting around that. I know you do appreciate that and you're going to put safeguards in, but we have to live with those safeguards and the implementation of them. So I, I know you get that, but that's why we keep going around here. Um, so I have a few random concerns. I had a statement which turned into this train wreck now that we had this whole <laughs> evening, and you know, so bear with me. I'm going to try and compose myself. Um, one of my big concerns is that this is a big plot that Got Space is looking into. Um, there's setbacks in place for this special permit process, um, but obviously with a big plot of land, you know, when you do planning and zoning, you want that business to be successful. That makes the town successful. Their success might mean expansion. So while they're planning on X amount of buildings now, I'm pretty sure they're going to plan on more buildings in the future. So how does that process play out if there is future expansion to you know, the setbacks are at this point now, but now they want to put more buildings up. Now what happens to the setbacks is that, I assume that's a new application, a new special permit, and right. then the, the town is able to be notified so we can partake in the process, right? Sure, yeah. for each for each yeah. building that they would propose, or for each application, I mean, an application could have multiple buildings, but for each, you know, application, they need to meet the, need to meet the regulation, so that's, so that's reviewed. If someone, in forgetting about God's space, but just anyone else, right. if right. they have a, a large piece of property, 
and they come in and they want to put one building on that property, they yep. come in with an application. Then if they come back and say, you know, we'd like to put another building on that property in a certain area, they would have to come back and show that they meet the uh, all of the... Uh, the whole uh, new process? Yes, it's a, it's, it's, yes, because it would be a, it's a, it's a new building. Uh, if they, again, if they came in and they had a proposal with three buildings, then you know, that would be that would be acted on for all three buildings because it would be one application. But again, if it's a single application for one building, it's completed. They want to come in for another building or another two buildings. They'd have to file the application and then would have to comply with the various zoning regulations. If they were to do another application, that's done by like a public notice type of thing. Yeah. It would be in this particular case because this is a special permit. So any application would be under the special permit, which would be then, you know, a public hearing on that. Um, understand my apprehension because the money that the town makes is incumbent upon the number of buildings and the wattage. So it's hard for me to feel reassured that there's going to be, you know, a slowdown of expansion because uh, money is at stake. So, you know, anyway. Um, so one of the other things... Uh, application for the generator use um, it says that they have to indicate when they plan on firing them days whatever but it doesn't really specify that we are able to put parameters around that so they could say we're gonna do it on Tuesdays at noon every week okay fine do we have the opportunity to say no that's not okay or is it just the application they, they just give the information and we accept it as is well again I don't want to ask for answer for Mr. Pagini, but I believe there would be, because it's a special permit, there are... Uh, There's a give and take. Yeah, yeah. There, okay. the, 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 there's, there's discussion on that. All right. I didn't want to assume on that. Um, I, I do just want to mention, as we mentioned before, I'm probably being redundant, but under a special permit, the commission has a, a great deal of latitude, if you would. More so than usual. Um, I know well water has been talked about in terms of them not using water to cool, but um, I know nothing about nothing, but a little bit about a lot of things. I've had well water all my life. So them doing construction in close proximity to my home, water tables are connected. What if that impairs my water source? I, you know, I, I don't know, but I know how wells work and it's all underground, all connected. You know, a big foundation goes in, you know, 500 feet away, and that's part of my water table. Um, and now I don't have water pressure. What's my recourse if that happens? Would you like to comment on that, Mr. Pagini? Or? It's certainly a concern that can be brought up during the special permit process, uh, during the application. Um, for most other applications, you know, if there are concerns regarding water quality, uh, they're brought up during the review process. I mean, I know because, you know, wells are expensive. It's expensive to drill. It's expensive to maintain. How long can that last? Um, the setbacks, as they're defined, um, I don't know if you guys actually covered that. The visual screening. Um, I know there's a lot of different things talked about. I'm kind of concerned there's going to be a wall of unknown origin right at the perimeter of the property. Is that? possibility the way things are worded no it was meant to be around the buildings um, the way it's written okay so not necessarily perimeter of property no around the buildings yes okay. um, the sound monitoring um, I'm hoping uh, I know a lot of people are worried about that the sound and the vibration and the constancy of it um, and the monitoring of it seems a little bit vague, and I think everybody's concerned about that. It would be nice if it were scheduled, maybe twice a year, every year. They pay for it, whatever. Um, and I say twice a year because I know when I go outside in the summer and it's humid, I hear things way down the center of town, but in the winter I don't hear anything. So it seems, I don't know, maybe a good idea to do it at two different times of the year because weather impacts how you hear things that might be kind of nice to incorporate. Um, well, about the uh, neighboring and abutting being, you know, infringed upon, I think it would be good if we didn't say something like abutting because 
you know, we've got the properties that are right next to it, and then there's properties right across the street that aren't abutting, that could be impacted. Um, and honestly, if somebody had a complaint a mile away, you've got a bigger problem. So you might want to know about that. I don't think, well, I hope not, but. Well, I would think if there's a complaint a mile away, people that are uh, mm -hmm. a quarter of a mile away would uh, be the first ones. But yeah, we'll be knocking on your doors, that's for sure. It'd be a big, big problem. I've got a doorbell. Enforcement of sound issues, I, th I think everybody kind of covered that. That's kind of like the, the police take care of that if it's an, so like if, you that's, know, that's, that's, the fir that's the first step. Yeah, so like if there was an issue and it's not during the monitoring time or whatever and suddenly I'm noticing stuff, you know, I would call the police department? You could call the police department, you could file a, compla uh, a complaint with okay. the uh, zoning enforcement officer. And I think another good reason to monitor on a regular basis every six months, every year or whatever, you know, I, I know that they'll update equipment like on a scheduled basis, but nothing says that they have to. Equipment breaks down, bolts come loose, makes noise. I just think that would be a good idea. All right, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman in the back with the uh, red sweater, red shirt. Commissioner, good evening, members. Bruce Swerka, 1043 Northrop Road. I'm going to go on a tangent. I have a lot of things that are bothering me, a lot that I don't understand. First off, Mr. Hine and Mr. Allison brought up the point about the noise level. There should be a baseline noise level developed now. Now waiting for someone. It needs to be developed now. Because if we don't have something now at the different times of the years, like some of the people have mentioned, we're going to count on someone who we're going to pay, who we're going to contract for, who we're going to give money to, to all of a sudden say it's okay. And then when the data centers are being built, it's going to be, geez, it doesn't work. I don't want to hear about the noise and the police and the having to come out to inspect it. I live on Northrop Road. And I'm going to tell you a story because I'm going to go off on it. This year, every weekend during the summer, all day Saturday, the electric division was on Northrop Road putting in new poles. The second weekend, I went out there and I said, why are you guys here on Saturday putting in poles? Because of the traffic. Yet my wife runs her daycare on Northrop Road, and we have to tell the parents to turn around in the driveway. We have to put signs out for all the trucks on the road. When I called the mayor and spoke with him, and I called the police chief and spoke with him about coming up, guess what I got? No one. No one came to my house. So when someone gets killed on Northrop Road, and I tell you I told you so, I will sue this town. Because I am tired of everybody saying to me, it's okay, we already figured it in. Planning and zoning passed it. I mean no harm to any of you gentlemen. No harm to anybody here. There's rights and there's wrongs. Just like the baseline for the noise. We need to establish it now. We need to establish it at different periods of the year when the air is dry and when the air is moist. Go to an airport. I don't know why we have to go to Virginia to find a noise consultant. Go to Bradley Airport. You want to talk about noise abatement? I spent 32 years at the airport. Airplanes can only take off and land at certain times. They can't land 24-7. They can't do that anywhere in the country. Certain times of the day, they have to use certain runways. In Boston, they can only land over the water. In JFK, they can only take off and land over the water. It's because of the rules that you people put in. The planning and zoning people at the airports there. The reverberation. The young lady was talking about the vibration. The vibration of the five decibels. What is that going to cause us? It's going to cause some of our houses internally to shake. And the neighboring neighborhoods, it's not adjacent, it's not neighboring. If you have a corridor of open area, that noise travels, just like that woman just said. The noise travels clear across town. She mentioned how she can hear it downtown. I hear the train when it comes to Wallingford every day, and I live in North Farms. It's just because there's a corridor of land that travels right up 68 and carries it right up. All those things, you gentlemen, have the opportunity 
to say no. We put in all that money for Bristol Myers. We're there. They're gone. These data centers, you know what they're storing right now? What we call the cloud. Well, it's not going to be here in five years. We're all going to have it on a stick on our phone. We're not going to need it. So now we're putting out all this promised money. I'm going to tell you the same thing I told the mayor. Numbers people are the best liars in the world. Because they can make any number work. I pleaded with him to please come to my home and sit in my driveway from 7 a.m. until 8.30 and try to pull out. I called the police and asked them to put the radar cart. I get it maybe once every other year. Until there's a death, nobody's going to do anything. With the noise, you're only asking for more trouble. Once the environmental impact, the warming of the environment alone is going to be damaging to ourselves and our wildlife. Man from open space. We all enjoy the beauty of it still. We knew there was going to be economic development. Years ago, when all of our farmland was put under and passed through IX, it was for one business. One. How many are there now? Too many. There are way too many things that we're counting on money. I bet you no one in the town knows that the electric division spent the entire summer on Northrop Road on Saturday on overtime, three full crews to put up new power lines and new poles. Do you know who we did that for? We did it for Meriden. Did Meriden pay for it? Who knows? It's more money that we're promised that we don't see. And we're going to get all these specialists to come in. And someone brought it up here tonight. Who does the specialist work for? Is he working for us, the town? Is he working for the business? Or is he working for the developer? One and one has to make two. We have the option to decide now what we want in our town for the better of our town. Everybody talks about five, five DBA. Everybody here run your lawnmower? Run your lawnmower without your headset on. That's what equivalents do. Or if you want to hear it, the vibration, put your engine down by the exhaust and let it stay there for five minutes. Tell me you don't have a headache after. It's all the same. We all wear ear protection now. It's a forced thing that we have to do. Police officers, when they go to the shooting range, they don't shoot with their ears open, they have their fire range, they have their hearing protection on because of the noise level. That air gets reverberated. It is going to change the entire impact of the entire North Farms area. Dry cooling. They're going to tell Mr. Pagini, oh, we can put the generators on the roof. What happens to the air pollution? What happens to the air noise that it's going to create? It's going to be full circle. We're not even touching the corner of the iceberg or the first piece of pie out of the circle this. We, we are headed in a bad place for the entire area, as well as some of the articles that were brought up already tonight about people that are suffering physical and mental ailments from this. It's only going to continue. It's only going to continue. Now, do we want to have that black heel mark on Wallingford for an assumed million dollars of building or a promissory? What are you going to do in two years when they say, sorry, we don't need iCloud anymore. It's not needed. We're closing the buildings. Then we have all this beautiful property that we have. Now with buildings that are developed, with who's going to be in them? Or who's going to pay for that first person that's killed on North Farms Road or North Road because one of those construction operators just happened not to look and ran over one of the kids in front of my wife's daycare. Oh, we're sorry. He's not from the state. He's from Virginia where they were from. I have some serious concerns as a resident. And it hurts. Our family has lived on North Road, I think it's 97 years this year. I think the Wall family has been here just over 100. And I think the Sella family has been there 80 plus. It's not fair to us to continue with all the generations of people having to fight this fight when we have you to protect us. We've been here for, what, three hours now? What did we accomplish? Thank you. What did we really accomplish? Poor Mr. Pagini's working his butt off as a newbie here. It's continual. I said to the mayor, are we going to keep paying this money out to have people move out? 
we got to realize that we are just too geographically tight here. We have a very limited open space left. Now you're going to take it away. We're going to take away another piece of it. We're going to take away another piece of it. We don't want farms anymore in Wallingford. Whose bright idea was that? Who said we don't want open land? Who said we don't want farmland? Who said that I shouldn't be able to enjoy after living on the same property for 53 years, that I can't stay there for 20 more and enjoy my life? That's what you're saying to me. You want to take and develop all of the houses around us so everyone's 20 feet apart? Please do it, but do it for all of us. Don't just do it to some of us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else would like to speak on the application? Sure. Uh, after this uh, young lady, anyone else? So I guess you saved me for last. I'm Diane Swarka. It's very nice to see you again. I live on 150 High Hill Road, and also my family lives on 1017 Northrop Road. Um, I've listened to everybody here and certainly echo all their concerns. Um, there is no reason to repeat it all. However, I have to say, this does remind me of the time when we fought the auto auction issues are very much the same. Mr. Fitzsimmons, you talked about monitoring, very important. High level of critical thinking, lights, electricity, water contamination, traffic, noise, the issues are the same. That was voted down for all the right reasons. It was voted down because it did not uh, fit to the, cat to the character of the neighborhood. This is the same exact project. It really doesn't fit the character of the neighborhood. As I recall, I think humming was a form of torture in World War II to um, uh, war prisoners. Uh, from what I've read, there's a town in Connecticut, Basra, that had the same kind of uh, plan in front of its planning and zoning, and they voted it down for all of the unanswered questions. I think the elephant in the room here is the fact that there are all unanswered questions. Granted, we don't have a plan in front of us yet, but this is exactly how the auto auction went. The more we talked, the more the applicant changed their application. The more we presented, the more they came back with answers. I am very concerned because it does not fit in the character within the character of the town. We shouldn't be known as the town with the big data center. As my cousin stated, Wallingford can do better. I don't think I want this in my backyard. Granted, I don't live as close as my sister does or my cousin to this land, but I think it would definitely affect the character of the neighborhood. We all have water, the watershed, for all the right reasons. It's the wrong plan. Please think hard and long about this. I respect what you have to do. You have a lot on your plate. You have to do all of your critical thinking. You have to consider the residents, the taxpayers. I am a taxpayer of two properties in this town. I am very concerned about what's going on in this town. We expect people to do the right things. Yes, you've listened for three hours. I've sat here for three hours. And I really think that many valid points are brought forward. But I can tell you, in healthcare, if there's no control, you stop. And it's not a safe project. We can't control this once it's in. Once it's built, the damage is done. You can't do anything about it. And you're not going to stand there and say, oh, I'll bring the police over, or I'll bring this other control agency over. They are going to do what they want to do and you won't be able to control it. And that's the biggest concern right here. And they'll want to expand, and they'll want to do all the things that they promised they wouldn't do. This is big money, but it's the wrong project for Wallingford. Thank you. So thank you. I guess with that, we've given every member of the public who wanted to speak an opportunity to speak. So it this, sir, we've given you the, the opportunity to speak. Certainly, as I mentioned, we're going to continue this until you know, next month, you'll have an opportunity to bring up additional concerns or have additional questions that you have. And we've, I think most people would agree, we've, you know, we spent over three hours on this and certainly have given everybody to have at least one bite at the apple. So with this, I guess I would bring it back to the commission. As, as I mentioned, we are obviously not going to uh, vote on this application this evening. So. At this point in time, we normally have a motion to continue this to a specific date, but uh, as I've indicated to some of the commission members, the uh, sound engineer had indicated that uh, the 14th of uh, 
February, which is our scheduled meeting for February, he is not going to be available. So we were discussing having a special meeting in the early part of February. I'm not sure at this point in time if we're in a position to come up with a specific date for commission members. Uh, and also, if I could direct my just attention, a question rather to Attorney Small, is the sound engineer given any dates that he may be available in uh, in, this, in uh, February? He hadn't by the close of the day, so I'll check tomorrow. Hopefully we'll have some dates tomorrow. Okay, so as far as now, we're gonna continue this. Would we need to continue it? Uh, oh, don't run away from the microphone. <laughs> would we need to, from a legal standpoint, would, would we have to give a specific date that we're continuing this to, or? You're it, yeah, you're continuing it to a special meeting and we'll post it as to what the date is gonna be. So that's what we would need a motion for then. Is that correct? For well, it's, you're not closed. The, I mean, the, the public hearing is still open until you close it, so. Yeah, nor normally what yeah. we do is maybe I'm just being a little bit too, uh, technical we don't need we're, we're continuing the public hearing we don't need to give a specific date today that we're continuing the public right. hearing to I guess that was my roundabout way of asking the question yeah I don't I don't think you have to give a specific you don't have date. to say it's staying open you don't have to specify I mean, it would normally be to your next meeting but we'll look to schedule a special meeting okay that being said I'm sure there's one or two Commission members that understood that and if they'd like to make a motion I'd appreciate it Mr. Chairman, I move that we continue the zoning text amendment hearing regarding data centers by special permit for IX and I-5 on a meeting to be determined for next month. Good, we have a, a second. Um, Mr. Chairman, be, before we do this motion, can, can I just uh, make a couple of comments on? Absolutely. On the, uh, uh, you know, comments. I, you know, we, we you know, the residents brought up some issues and one of the issues that I had from the beginning, we didn't get into uh, real specifics, but I just wanna make sure when the sound engineer comes in, uh, vibration and hum is, is really a key um, factor that, uh, you know, we don't have any quantitative, quantitative uh, measurements for that. And I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, he, he comes up with some type of uh, measurements that, uh, you know, we can chew on, I guess. And, uh, you know, folks mentioned how to, how to measure that. You know, I think that is a key uh, factor. Did not bring that up at the beginning because... Uh, didn't know how specific we were gonna get. And I and I just wanna make, you know, one comment um, on the revised regulations because, you know, Ms. Mays brought up a really good point that, um, you know, I was concerned about as well. And she, she brought it up and it's basically you know, she's absolutely right that we've, we've kind of, with these revised regulations, we've kind of given some of our authority away as far as, you know, how we handle the special permit. So I, I just want to, you know, it's, it's actually paragraph 5A from the revised October 12th uh, memo to, you know, the current one revised January 4th. Forth. And basically, um, about the wording not substantially raise, and now it's you know allowing for that five decibel increase. So I, I, I just you know want to bring that up to you know our attention. I, I, I think that's worth looking at, um, and you know by the time we have our meeting with the sound engineer, I think we'll have, you know, a little time to, to mull that over. So with that, I'll, I'll second the motion to. Uh, uh. <laughs> we have a, a second on the motion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Abstained? 
Any objections? Okay, this will be continued to uh, another meeting. It will be sometime, I think, in uh, February. Certainly that will be posted, and everyone will be made uh, aware of that. And, uh, again, I appreciate the, uh, the public from coming out, expressing their concerns. Uh, hopefully people realize that uh, you know, it does not fall on the uh, deaf ears of the commission, whether or not you agree or don't disagree with us. Uh, I mean, keep in mind that uh, certainly the commission does listen to all of the public and takes to heart the comments that they've made. With that... Mr. Pacini, we're going to turn the meeting over to you to continue with bond releases and reductions. Uh, so, oh, is on? Oh. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, number two, uh, tractor supply is not going to be released. There are still some uh, landscaping issues on that property. And I have written a letter and addressed those to the applicant. Bond release number three, uh, that looks fine. It was just a residential uh, house. Uh, number four, I didn't find any issues, so that bond is good to be released. And 238 Hall Ave has uh, completed their site work, and that bond is good to be released. Okay, and uh, as Mr. Allison has taken a brief break, I'd ask Mr. Perrin if you would please vote on uh, any motions that, be made, that would be made concerning the bond releases. And at this, point, at this particular point in time, I'd entertain uh, motions to release the various bonds as recommended by our town planner. Mr. Fitzsimmons. Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I have a question um, to town planner on number five. Yep. Um, it says landscaping will have to be postponed until spring due to the current weather conditions. None of the bond that Mount we're holding is for landscaping? Uh, no. And I've gotten written confirmation that the landscaping will be completed, uh, and it's signed by him as well. Um, okay. I didn't know if it was <coughs> fair to hold up the, uh, the bond. Yeah, no, this, this has been a challenging one. So, um, Mr. Chairman, based upon recommendations from the town planning office, I recommend the release and reduction of um, bonds for number three, Alfonso and Maria LaCourie, number four, Catazarua at 150 South Main Street, and number five, Hall Avenue, as recommended by the town planner. Good. And Mr. Allison, just to make you aware, I've asked Mr. Parent to vote in your place as when Mr. Pagini was discussing the bond releases, uh, you were uh, not available. So with that, I'd entertain a motion, uh, a second rather on the motion to uh, release the bonds as recommended. Second by Mr. Co Second by Mr. Cohan, uh, voting beginning with Mr. Hine. Yes. 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 And yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, Mr. Pacini. Uh, administrative approvals. There was just one survey waiver this month, and that was it. Um, and I have Amy here to discuss the. Uh, ZBA enforcement report and how she plans on uh, setting it up moving forward. Mrs. Torrey, the floor is yours. Is there a mic on? Okay. theme of the evening is measurement. <laughs> and so the best way I could figure to approach it, although you know we're all a bit weary, is um, to offer your input to me from what you'd like to see. Because what we've been providing you is a laundry list of how good the data entry is in our office, <laughs> not how enforcement is happening. So it's not measuring the correct items the database. There's things that don't go on the database because the activity is occurring and perhaps it's wrapped up and closed without ever making it. So you don't see that. You don't see the fields, for example, legal referrals that was raised at the last meeting. You see 
a laundry list of violations over time, 10 iterations of access, which it's provided on, that are not compatible with one another and our systems. So I can't really manipulate the data to come up with a report. So to that end, what is the information I may provide you with? And I will design either a report, whether it be in text format, an Excel spreadsheet, but this is where we're at. So we keep providing you a report that is meaningless or it's not getting the information you need to see. So the best, the best measure is what do you want to measure and what can I offer you and in what kind of form? Some uh, input for uh, Mrs. Torrey is what they would like to see on the report. Go ahead. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just, uh, you know, I, I, I think the, the old one was, you know, a pretty good start. I mean, you got, you know, the date, you know, the violation comes in, you know, first notification date, um, you know, uh, resolution date, you know, any type of, you know, follow-ups that, um, you've done and, you know, maybe not had, you know, success with the, you know, violator, you know, how many times you've, uh, you know, gone out to their house to say, you got to get rid of that rooster. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, legal referral might, might be a good one. Just don't have to get into details, but, you know, checkbox. And yeah, the, the, you know, the nature of the violation, I think I said that. Mr. Fitzsimmons. I would agree uh, with Commissioner Cohen, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you, thank you, thank you. It, it's, it's, not a, it's a thankless job, I'm sure. Um, but we, you and I have discussed um, zoning violations and perceived zoning violations. I, I think I would agree with the, the comments that, that um, Commissioner Cohen said, I would, I like the format, you, but if I heard correctly, it's an access, access database, which no one's using anymore, right? Or I should correct myself okay. what it is. Again, it really is a measurement of how sure. you would like me or staff, support staff, mm. to expound their time. Because it's a, a, a violation is created, and not always, and Mr. Cohen's, um, Reference to the rooster is a perfect example. We hmm. sort of have a process for some of these recurring, smaller, seem to resolve themselves, violations where, you know, automatic notice goes out. It's not a violation. It's sort of a, hey, did you know? Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time, they're rectified. I get a phone call. It's all gone. It never hits the database. Yeah. And, and then the opposite is true. You have these things where it's referencing these old ones which were created. Mm. Activity is this thick in a file and handwritten notes and phone calls and service by marshals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But all you're seeing is an open date yep. or, of course, habitual. You know, it, it, it gets closed, it gets reopened. So it's a great thing to archive our history mm -hmm. for, for compliance issues, um, to reference, to use that database. What I mean is it's not that access isn't working. Mm. It's gone through so many evolutions and updates that it's almost impossible to manipulate it to, to capture the data you want. So the, the, we're almost at a start over point. Yep. What, you know, what information you want to have because it's not being presented to you. It's basically I'm pushing a button on a report and saying, oh, I didn't get 20 things mm -hmm. logged into that yet. Doesn't mean 20 things weren't worked on. Right. So, so that, that's where we're at. So this is a perfect time to start fresh. Yeah. I, I, would, I, would agree, I would agree with how you said, if I might, Mr. Chairman. I, I think I'd agree, you should get credit for everything that's reported and resolved before it even gets a chance to, you know, so you almost need a, a tally at the beginning. You know, oh, you know uh, uh, violations reported, violations closed, violations still open. It's a scorecard, like a baseball scorecard, mm -hmm. so to speak. I, I have asked several times, 
to have the list sorted chronologically. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of like the police blotter, which runs every Sunday in the Record Journal. It shows you the date that someone got pulled over, the time, it, it, but it's in chronological order. That's, I, I get and respect the fact that we can see the rooster complaints and the illegal dwelling complaints. I, I think for me, because I think I was concerned was, some of these are so old, and the only other question I had was, and we started this meeting three, three plus hours ago about enforcement. Your job is so important, I, I need to know that everything is moving. And I say that to you because I know, you know, next month's meeting we have somebody who, who is a zoning violation that I've talked to you about numerous times finally coming into P&Z, but it's just, it, it took forever. It took forever just to get them to apply. I know there's a lot of work on your part to get people to do that, but the other piece of it is, and I'm sorry mm -hmm. she's gone, is any referrals to legal. Because mm -hmm. if we're about to add a regulation that's gonna require a lot more effort, all zoning enforcement should have some documentation of effort. And so all I'm looking for, I'm personally looking for is what's been referred to legal and kind of a scorecard. There's a lot of, there's a lot of violations and I know all of us who sit up here hear people say, how could you guys allow that? How, and my favorite, listen, it's a zoning violation. If you don't wanna call it in, I'll call it in. But then I hear, well, nothing's happening. And I know things are happening and I, you know, so I just want you and us, you particularly, to get credit for what's happening. But also, is there, is there 10 things in legal or is there 50 things in legal? That's, that's, the, that's the issue I don't know. So that's what I have. Thank you. Other Thank commission you. members? Again, from my perspective, I think some of the comments that were made were very good, but from the ones that are in legal, especially some of the old ones, as you know, we have, you know, it's been referred to legal and whenever, and that's what we have. I guess I, while I'm sure there's a very thick file, I'm not interested kind of what's at the bottom of the file. I'm kind of interested in, from a legal standpoint, what's at the top of the file as far as where do we stand today? I know it's been referred to, there were a couple that, you know, we had talked about and not to pick on cheap auto rentals because that's been around for whatever, but again, with that one, I'm not sure if it's back in legal or wherever it is, but you know, what's, what's the status of that and what's the action plan? Is that just, it's been referred to legal? I'm not picking on any department because I'm sure people are working diligently on a lot of things, but is that just kind of sitting there and something? It's out of our, it's out of, it's out of zoning. Yeah. Oh, no. it, we've exhausted oh, no, that's, all measures. So. Well, that's what I mean. But it's so just, once oh, it goes to legal, but, yeah, but just, it, it, it's not worked anymore. At the yeah, court I know. But, system, but, but, so. see, but something like that, though, I just you know, kind of just like an just an update on just that a, mm -hmm. as far as what's the most current thing with it. Okay, it's in legal, but what are we doing? And with some of the other violations that Mr. You know, Fitzsimmons brought up last month, as far as. Uh, with uh, multifamily and mm -hmm. illegal dwellings. With, with that, um, how is that being handled? Uh, it's on our zoning enforcement log. It's shown up as a violation, but again, what's what's happening with that is, has a fire marshal gone out there? Do they have some uh, authority to issue whatever? I'm not sure. Uh, the building department. Uh, do they have some responsibility or they have some authority to do that? So just how are things like that progressing? That's, that's kind of where my, where my interest is. So if I'm understanding correctly, I just want to clarify. Are you, are you looking for sort of scorecard for the month? Because that's what it is. It's a monthly or do, again, should I just reproduce everything, which means, oh, I never closed or cheap autos. Forgive me for picking on you. But um, a perfect example, it was referred years ago and a stipulated agreement was entered into yep. of, you know, way before my tenure, mm -hmm. probably Understand. three iterations ago. So there is no work on that. <laughs> it's, so to, the, to, to respond to what's the status of it, it would be to the legal department and the town attorneys who are taking it out of the hands. I can certainly provide you a date to say yep. I've, I've exhausted everything I can do. Um, that being an, a whole other issue is, is having teeth. Sure. Um, you know, love to, 
like the roosters, you know, most <laughs> times we can just kind of say, well, you probably didn't know, so maybe, you know, but you can't have them. And, and it generally, generally will work. Um, so I, you know, have to work those angles, but then you have the dare use. <laughs> And the times, and for example, the accessory apartments are another good thing that's not reflected on their illegal dwelling units. If it is something that's able to become a, a legal dwelling unit, even if it's in arrears, very often you're, you're getting the applications which are the results mm -hmm. of those, but the two things aren't speaking. You're, yeah. you're, so it, that's the remedy. Of course, we know there's folks that attempt a variance to after the fact. And, and once again, not being successful, that's now sent to court. Um, so it's out of the hand. So, but anyway, love to give you a scorecard. If you're looking at a month, sort of, that's, I mean, come to my desk. I'll take a picture of, you know, my, it's all a bunch of handwritten notes and phone slips and, you know, where do you have to be? But, you know, to consolidate that into the information that is a measure of what you're, the information you're seeking. I'd rather give you that than just saying, this is silly, I'm not going to print that same report again. That I didn't get to fill in a field yet. Didn't mean it didn't happen. Like maybe I did close it, but the data entry didn't happen yep. yet. So it's still showing open, open, or, or clean up the old stuff that's just hanging around that yeah. isn't even a violation anymore. It's just still sitting on the database. So again, rather give you something that is informative. Yes, Mr. Sim, if I, if I could jump back to something the chairman said, I, you know, and, and this is, it's awful. We all, we all saw the news this weekend about that awful fire yesterday in the Bronx. And, and my day job is insurance, you know. Um, sitting in on claims calls when people talk about things, illegal dwelling units or illegal um, residents, it's a problem, because, and, I, and I, you know, we've debated this because certain towns and municipalities and certain law firms will say, well, the town knew about it, they're liable. In addition to the building owner and everything else, the illegal dwelling, whether it be a, you know, an unapproved rooming board or a, an unapproved accessory apartment, that we're serving electrical and water. That's the, that's the question I'm thinking of, and that's why I was concerned, because at first you had, the, you know, there, there's been two, major fires just in the last couple of weeks with loss of life, I assume they're properly zoned. But if they weren't, and it's the Bronx, it'll be awful. Mm -hmm. And we, ha you know, I think of the Hall Avenue project that we just released the bond to, that that should never have happened the way it did. You know, we did everything we were supposed to, you did everything you were supposed to, and come to find out they didn't have COs. You know, it wasn't a zoning violation, but something, something slipped, something dropped. So. I, I, I remain concerned about dwelling units and resident, you know, and, and life safe, healthy issues in addition to what's been referred to legal. Couldn't agree more. As much as the roosters. Don't miss no. you know, Roosters well, are important, human life's important, but the uh, you know. level of property transfers <laughs> yeah. has yielded many, many more sure. uh, refinances, et cetera, of, of brought many of these dwellings. And of course, the market is conducive to that now. So all of a sudden, and we do try to, just so you know, because that is very upsetting to me as well. Just on a, try to appeal to people, never mind, I know you're violating, but you, mm -hmm. you could be putting people at serious right. risk. Um, if it's not up to fire code or there's stuff in a basement or there whatever the case yep. may be. And believe it or not, sometimes that works. And those, sure. those don't make sure. it either with the roosters no. because they get a little nervous and, you know, then think of, think of others. So duly noted, I will work on it. We'll give you a sample first round. Next month, that's something, again, that's informative, but I am certainly available as we're kind of trying to come up with this to um, put, your, put, what, put what you want in it. I'm not going to design something that works for me. I'd rather have it to inform you. So thank you. Thank you. You're up, Mr. Pagini. Uh, I have no further comments. <laughs> uh, she does a lot of work that she can't necessarily doesn't have time to, to log, so I understand where she's coming from. Maybe I'll just put a dry erase board in the office and she can mark it up as they uh, <laughs> go off. So with that, I take it it brings us to the uh, end of our agenda. Is that correct? Yes. That's, uh, that was the last item.
Terrific. At this point in time, I'd entertain a uh, motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn until yeah, Valentine's Day. Second. <laughs> <laughs> You're always a romantic to remind of that, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Uh, we have a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? We're adjourned. Have a good evening, gentlemen. <laughs>